people who come to me want often to experience their the edges of their comfort zones and like my job as a guide is then to to find out where they actually are because i wouldn't actually want that participants actually reach these edges because then you have a whole lot of aftermath to take care of right in terms of avoiding trauma and or dealing with trauma and and uh it's it you know a lot of things can happen once you cross the comfort zones my experience is however that the edge of the comfort zone is not where we think that it is right once we are there we realize that oh actually it's not here right it's it's still a bit further hello fellow curious earthlings welcome to episode seven of the curious on earth podcast i'm your host hendo soinuma and this is my conversation with huck Mideke, who is a survival expert, a wilderness guide, and uh, an all-around very interesting person. Uh, for those of you who are watching this, you might uh, wonder why I'm uh, speaking with my eyes closed. I've recently um, had to admit to myself that I really uh, don't like doing these uh, introductory monologues, especially when I'm looking into the camera. It's somehow very difficult to get my speech flowing that way, so I decided uh, as an experiment to to see how this feels if I do it eyes closed and uh, right now I feel that this is a, a more natural way for me to do it so that's why I'm going this way. Huck is very interested in questions related to living sustainably on this planet living in ways that don't destroy life that don't lead us towards the end of civilization. During our six-hour conversation, we cover a lot of stuff, including um, how Huck got started uh, as an activist, and also how he ended up living in a yurt in Joensu. For the past four years, he's been living in a yurt, which he, which he says is not a very interesting fact, but uh, considering how rare it is, uh, for someone in Finland to live all, all year round in a yurt, I would say, for, for most people listening, it's probably somewhat interesting. Huck lives in what he calls Nomad Town, which is a resi resilience hub. Uh, resilience hubs are spaces or places that are created uh, in order to try out, do experimentation, on a st sustainable, resilient ways of living. There's also been media coverage of Huck's involvement uh, in an experiment where uh, a bunch of people lived for a month in a forest without using any money. And uh, these kinds of projects uh, shed a bit of light on, on Huck's approaches. He's not uh, just a theoretical guy, but a very practical guy. He also talks about how he started to feel the calling of the wild when he was a kid. Um, and he shares about his work as a wilderness guide, the kinds of experiences he offers or, or supports people in heaven. And he talks about uh, being a survival expert. He talks about six survival priorities and types of survival situations. His thinking about survival covers both like small uh, situations, like if you're lost in a forest, what do you do? But also, if you find yourself in the midst of a civilization that's standing on unsustainable grounds, what do you do? Mm, he talks about the stop tool, stop, think, observe, and plan. And the full moon, full stop uh, ritual or practice that he developed on the basis of, of the stop tool. We also talk about whether um, the tendency to spread, to push borders, to experiment is uh, a human or even an animal in its need, something that we need almost as much as we need to breathe or we need warmth. Huck puts a lot of his focus into low-tech solutions, because he thinks quite a bit of the high-tech solutions have been tried out already, and, and the results of those experiments 
haven't really satisfied him. And I ask him whether he thinks that a high tech civilization will be here a hundred years from now or a thousand years or even a million years from now. And it seems that he's not especially convinced of that. Whether or not we can survive as a high tech civilization, I still find it very inspiring that there are people who are looking into l low complexity, low tech solutions to the challenges we face uh, on this planet. We also discuss uh, Huck's interest in uh, something you might consider a bit surprising, which is the super yacht scene. So people who own these large yachts, like luxury boats that uh, mostly the richest people in the world can afford to spend time in. Um, we also discuss fatherhood and uh, being a father, Huck has thought quite a bit about the importance of being able to transmit sustainable ways of living to your children, uh, which he feels that we mostly are not able to do. So he's interested in what would it take uh, for us to be able to do that. I really love the way that Huck is engaging with the world. Um, though the things he talks about uh, do have quite a grim background, I would still say that he is a, a very positive person who engages the world with the spirit of curiosity. And uh, yeah, I'm really glad to be finally able to present this new episode to you. Um, this was the second Curious on Earth podcast that was recorded live instead of over uh, a vir virtual meeting, and I prefer this format so much more. Just uh, being in the same room with the people you're having a discussion with really uh, brings something relevant to the discussion. And, uh, and before we begin, I'd just like to remind you that if you enjoy what I'm doing, uh, please like or comment, or subscribe, share uh, the episode, and uh, if you also want to support the podcast more, you can uh, check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash curious on earth. I actually will be uploading an extra video that we did uh, over a Zoom call after we did this one. So there was one topic uh, that we didn't have time to uh, discuss here. So we did an extra bit. So that's, that's going to be available for Patreon subscribers in the near future. I'm thinking of uploading it to both my Patreon pages. So the Curious on Earth page is the English one, and then my other one is Sonon Mahendra, uh, which I'll put the link also in the show notes. So here we go. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Huck Mideke. Huck Mideke, tervetuloa. Welcome to the Curious on Earth podcast. Uh, you're a wilderness guide and a survival expert. Uh, can you just, uh, in your own words, tell a bit about what, is, what it is that you do and what you focus on and what you're passionate about? Mm, thank you, Henry. Um, welcome, everyone, to this podcast. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here. So, yeah, just um, what am I doing? What am I passionate about? I guess it's pretty close to what the wilderness guide does and that is making helping people feel home in us nature uh, building bridges between the modern human experience and natural realities finding possible ways for us to go um, looking at the needs and desires of the group and looking at the natural possibilities to accommodate those needs and wants. Mm. Yeah, survival expert. Uh, well, that's pretty much my passion, I would say, survival. Um, I'm always careful calling myself a survival expert because the, the real survival experts that I know, they don't know how to read or write. They live in indigenous communities around the world and know how to live off the land and make everything that they need uh, with their own hands in their communities. So I'm not such a survival expert that I would like to be. Uh, at the same time, I've been, or the topic of survival and sustainability has been in my life pretty much for as long as I can remember, since early childhood. 
um, I guess in comparison to others, I can be called an expert on those. Mm. Yeah, my passion is, as I said, is is finding scalable solutions, finding ways where we can go, um, understanding the needs and wants of the group, of the human society, putting them in perspective with geopolitical developments and what else yeah that's uh, maybe that's enough for now hmm. yeah i think uh from here i wanna start with the yurt because uh, as i mentioned before i have a tendency to be quite abstract and i think when you have something visual and concrete it's easier to anchor or ground mm -hmm. uh what what uh what the person is saying so so yeah, you for the last four years, I guess now five years, ben. five years. Okay, you've lived in a yurt in uh, Joensuu, and uh, maybe we can just start out by you describing what actually is a yurt. Okay, so a yurt is a nomadic uh, structure, a shelter. Um, the first or the probably most most known yurts and gears, as they are also called. Um, are from areas like Mongolia, but very similar structures can be found in many nomadic societies. It's a relatively lightweight shelter in comparison to a house, for example, or a tiny house or so. And <clears throat> yeah, so now I'm like it's 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 a tent. It has these trellis walls, like these crisscross walls made of uh, wood, and then there is a two layers of wool and then tent fabric around and <clears throat> um, it's five and a half meters in diameter. So the size I chose to accommodate three people, um, which is sufficient for three people very much. Uh, there's a stove in there, wood stove, and it's off grid. So I make my own electricity from third hand solar panels and I have a muscle power generator so I can use my legs to charge my electronic devices. I have, I think, five electronic devices, couple of power banks, but I put them in the same category. So everything is USB powered and yeah, works quite well. Mm. Um, when you describe yurt as a tent, what is a tent actually? <laughs> Like, oh, yeah, what, what distinguishes a tent from something that is not a tent? Because uh, a yurt is something that also feels like a, it's a building, and uh, uh, not every tent feels like a building. Yeah, well, yurt is somehow, I mean, a tent has walls made of fabric, right? So there's a, there are a lot of walls, the, the yurt wall and ceiling and roof, everything is, is, is made of, of fabric. Um, and just like in any other tent, you would, unless you hang up the tent, you know, suspend it between two trees or something, you would in any tent have at least one center pole or some, you know, when you look at the normal hiking tent, you have some poles in there. And in the case of the yurt, it's just this wooden trellis walls and, and the uh, wood rafters. So it's maybe a bit more solid tent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure it's warmer. There's insulation. So. Mm. Hmm. You mentioned in some interview that I cannot recall the exact phrasing, but but you said that you feel that there is nothing special in living in a yurt because so many people are and have been living in yurts throughout the ages. But uh, when you think about Finland and and Joensuu and living all year round in yurt in a yurt, I think it's somewhat special. Mm, yes, in a way. Like, I, I think there are not so many people living in yurts in Finland or in the uh, Scandinavian areas or northern northern countries. Um, and when I say it's not really special, I mean, it's just a shelter, right? So uh, once I was in, in some party with a friend and the friend in, introduced me to someone else and said, like, hey, this is Haki, he's living in a yurt. And I was like almost upset because... It's like, I'm not saying, hey, this is Henry, he's living in Rivitalo, you know, it's like, what does it say about you? You know, it's, 
not saying very much because circumstances might be behind why you're living in the shelter that you're living. So in a way, I think a yurt is not very special. Um, you know, for example, to to a cabin or a cottage. You know, it's very similar. It's a small sized shelter, and <clears throat> mine is just a mobile one because of some some like. I was considering a tiny house on wheels. I was also looking at cottages or little mummunmukit, these grandmother houses or cottages. Um, and then I had the yurt because I knew that the yurt, I can be more flexible. So now I'm on a rented land, which um, would not, this land would not be available for me if my shelter would not be mobile. So that's the reason how it came to a yurt. Uh, I wanted something mobile ideally um just for the sake of uh flexibility and freedom and a year it was i could i could accomplish a year it faster than a tiny house so yeah hmm. uh just as a, a small detour if you needed or wanted to to move with the yurt how long would it take for you to just like get everything packed get everything packed like everything that you would want to have moving with you okay so if if we're only talking about the yurt right and, and the, uh, the empty yurt okay empty yurt yeah. the, the and taking down and putting up the yurt with a team of three four people takes maybe four hours down and up again mm -hmm. right so and if you then add the moving part of of all all the belongings you know what you might have in your apartment you know packing all the boxes then it's pretty similar to another move like i have all this wilderness guide equipment in the yard i have like um a lot of stuff that i accumulated because i could get the stuff um and thought okay this is amazing material to build a i don't know a tent stove out of it um i have a tent stove but in case somebody else wants to build one here is a free material so i accumulated all this stuff often for others in because i assume that uh, that might come in handy and it has come in handy also sometimes people say, hey i want to build a tent stove do you have some ideas and I say, well i have some ideas and i also some materials so you can have those so mm -hmm. so there's quite a lot of stuff in my opinion Mm. So it takes like a normal move, I would say. Yeah. So then maybe you would prefer to have a couple of days or a week to prepare, like to pack stuff. Because I'm thinking um, we have a friend family who, who built tiny houses and they started with building their own 20 square meter piece and then they designed it to be modular. So they've added, they've added pieces uh, to that. And I think there's now three or four pieces including a sauna but they said that if they wanted to move the house uh, it would take like a week of course that's not counting uh, properly all the furniture mm. and the sort of normal moving yeah. moving stuff but uh, but yeah just like to contextualize because yeah tiny, tiny houses are generally meant to be moved when necessary also yeah if they are on wheels or can be lifted on a trailer yeah yeah, I think that's like permanently built on a trailer, but it's also uh, their house is connected to the uh, how do you say like what water piping in mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. place where they live. But uh, yeah, um, maybe you can you can share the story of how, or or actually before I say that, I, I want to say that it feels special because because it's in this context. Uh, it's unusual and it's like at attention grabbing in the sense that you just i don't know like do you know if there's how many people do you know in finland that live in a yurt i know oh, i think about of 10 yurts that uh, are that i have seen somewhere where people are <laughs> at least living some time in often it's used like some kind of second accommodation for guests or as a summer cottage accommodation um I think there are less than five yurts that are permanently lived in, to my knowledge. Mm. I might be wrong. Mm. Yeah, so it's quite easy to see why it's like uh, attention-grabbing to hear about that. I understand it, yes. 
in in a way I understand it kind of from from a different perspective. From my perspective, it's just like a convenient shelter. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But okay, your your path towards towards like buying a yurt and uh, and starting to live in a yurt. How did that come about? What was the process? Mm -hmm. What like uh, I'm I'm going to ask you later uh, maybe about like sort of your longer term history but like the what feels like the most relevant to mm. your decision i mean the the story with youth living started basically when my son was born um which is soon 15 years ago and like i knew that the lifestyles that were available to us and that we were living were not something that I would that I felt comfortable that you know that I, I didn't feel that this is safe for for my child to copy, right? It was like lifestyles where there would be dependencies on electricity grid, water grid, um, hardware stores, experts, and um, dependency on money, like the the house we were living in. Um, and so I, I knew all the time that I want something more lightweight and more independent, kind of safer also. And then what really changed something was maybe seven years ago, um, I organized an experiment of one month living without using fossils using money and making rubbish. So these were kind of the criteria to measure sustainability. If there's no fossils used, no money used, with money being a detour, fossils not being sustainable, sufficiently sustainable, and, and rubbish also, of course, not being really an option. So we made this experiment with a couple of people. And after maybe two weeks, after we had kind of settled into the experiment and had found out where we can source what, what the neighbors are able to give to us, what do they need, what can we give to them, and so on. Um, it almost seemed that we are only sitting by the fire and eating food. Like, this is how, how it eventually felt like that. Um, I, I called it a sneak peek into paradise, and I thought, okay, I, I want something as close as possible to this for my son. And then I looked into those possibilities, no eco-villages in North Karelia, and thought, okay, I need to start something like this. And uh, when I communicated this desire to kind of move out of the lifestyle into another lifestyle uh, to my wife at that time, it turned out that she would have liked to continue living in the house together. And so we decided to split up and I moved into a yurt just two and a half kilometers from where I used to live. So it's very easy for my son to reach. And yeah, so now he gets, uh, at least from one of the parents, also a different lifestyle. I think it's quite good that he gets to kind of see both realities, like, you know, that he sees or that he has access to a lifestyle that is similar to what all his friends have, you know, like houses and, I don't know, toasters, microwaves, ovens, light switches, um, computer, fast internet, you know, all these push button comforts and, and that he also, on the other hand, um, at least sees that it's possible to try. Uh, to to achieve higher levels of sustainability, so I'm I'm not saying that I I'm I'm succeeding in showing my son a sustainable lifestyle, but at least I'm showing that I'm trying to find out what a sustainable lifestyle is and how it could look like. So I I think that's that's at least something that uh, can be safely copied. This I don't know adventurous approach of trying out. Mm. Was it a surprise? To you that your wife didn't want to yes somehow it was um i didn't think it would be a reason to split up um but now i see that it um, was probably better that way and we are in peaceful terms with each other so that's i i'm pretty okay with how, how things are 
Yeah. Hmm. Okay, well, if you want to continue precisely on how the yurt came about uh, as a concrete option. Mm. Yeah, so... Um, also, did you have experience of uh, spending time in people with people who lived in yurts? Mm, actually, the first time I spent a night in a yurt was in my own yurt. Mm -hmm. um, but I had been extended periods of time in the woods um, in the winter without a heated tent. And I knew that I can be warm, dry, and safe without the comforts of a heated tent, even in very cold winter. And I have been in uninsulated heated tents, where it's even when it's very cold, like this Bolioko, those platoon tents of army or so, where you can have a small wood stove. It's, it's even when it's very cold outside, you can have a temperature inside where you can take off your gloves and do work. So I assume that the insulated yurt with a more efficient wood stove and like, I don't know, better um, better comforts would be sufficient. So, and that assumption I think was right. So yeah, I, I think I had enough experience, but no personal yurt experience. And was it obvious at that point that, that the yurt is the the choice? Mm, well, tiny house on wheels was mm -hmm. was uh, yeah. in in my mind. I looked for those and and had drawn plans and designed some own ideas. I've been building houses with my with the grandfather of my son, so he was a or is a builder. So I've often been building houses with him, um, and felt quite confident that I could build my own tiny house. Um, and then it was like bit of a time issue. I had some money available and then I decided to buy a ready yurt. Um, of course, minus the furniture, minus the stove, like that is all. Also the whole floor, I made myself like this insulation platform solution and yeah. It was not obvious that it would be a yurt. It, the criteria was something small and mobile. You mentioned also somewhere that uh, you, do, you don't necessarily find that a permanent solution for you. You also mentioned the uh, longev uh, longevity, is that the word? Longevity of or something, the, the service life, basically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, to me, like, when I look at the house, house living, I, I need an expert. I need hardware store materials to maintain it, repair it. Um, and... And with the yurt, kind of the weak point is the fabric, the outside fabric. So I can make the insulation myself. I can make the, you know, repair all the woodwork myself. I can work on the, you know, build the stove myself. What I cannot do is making the outside fabrics, which eventually will need to be replaced at some point. I can do all the sewing. Um, one of my great hobbies is sewing. I have two sewing machines in the yurt, so... Um, but I cannot make the fabrics themselves. So that is, in my opinion, the weak point. And of course, another option, uh, another um, angle is that when I look that we have in Finland about 42 square meters of living space, floor space per person on average. Of course, there are people who you know, live on, on 11 square meters with three people maybe. But there are also people who live in a big house uh, alone, right? Where there used to be a whole family living. So the average is not the medium. The medium. So when I look at these forty-two square meters per person, to me it stands to reason that just by communication and mindset shift, we can avoid having to build new buildings, including the yurt, right? So that's. Um, I think a shared shared living space is usually a better option than building something new. Um, regarding replacing the the fabric, how like in traditional cultures that use the yurts, what's the fabric there? Um, like in Mongolia, the the only outside fabric is the wool, um, and that works because until climate change impact 
or climate change had impact on the local climate in Mongolia that was sufficient. So very dry climate, dry cold. In Finland, it's a bit wetter. Also in Mongolia, by now it's a bit wetter. Um, also the <clears throat> angle of the yurt roof is a bit steeper. It's made in Finland for Finnish conditions. So it holds snow weight better and sheds water better than, than this kind of traditional somehow flatter yurt roof um, comes with the disadvantage that you have more heat going up so you have a bigger space to heat when you have a steeper roof no. mm. and have you also checked like uh, do you know about the infrastructure required to create the fabric that you use currently like wh how how complex is is that process well this is like kind of a high-tech tent fabric so it's uh, um, a mix of uh, cotton and uh, i believe polyester and yeah this is factory made um like up to eco like all the all the materials in my yurt they are to ecotech standards um and also the the sheep wool comes from organic um sheep farming in austria I, I i know all this because i when i applied for the construction permit i decided i want to b have a construction permit for the yurt even though i strongly believe that civil disobedience also in these areas is is very uh, valid um but i wanted to have this construction permit as a kind of to to set an example so that in at that time uh, at least i to my knowledge it was the first permanent living yurt setup in Finland so that if somebody else wants to live in a yurt somewhere or in something that is less or more than a yurt that they could say hey but this guy in the UN so he has a construction permit why can't I get out one so and I got the permit and had to get all the certificates for you know fire safety and um, it was also a very nice reason to talk with the neighbors because the neighbors have to sign that they are okay with it so Nice, nice, uh, nice to have a reason when you knock on the neighbor's doors without just the reason of wanting to knock on the neighbor's doors. No. Yeah, this is like a, I don't know if this is too often, too much of an in-depth question regarding technicalities. But I found myself thinking that I don't really know what polyester is in the sense of how it's created. Mm, it's oil-based. Uh -huh. um, it's what you find in any fleece jacket. It's PES. In, in when you look in your labels of on the clothing, it's very common. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm just thinking like what the the, the manufacturing process is like, and I'm also trying to think whether it's something similar because um, we have a bell tent. Mm -hmm. You know the the mm -hmm. the beige colored one yeah. that's quite often like so weirdly. I don't know who constructs them because different outlets sell them branded as their own trademark or yeah. their own, own um, brand I, name i, I think but it's quite know. popular design from manufact many manufacturers um and probably there too you either have complete cotton fabric or you have like a a, a mix mm -hmm. yeah i don't know why i have i Probably at some point I have checked what the material is, but if I have, I have completely forgotten yeah, it about it. Makes it yeah. more rot proof, like you know, against mold and, and more UV proof than as if it were only cotton. Hmm. Yeah. Better tear resistance and but so basically uh when that fabric runs out, you don't know of any way of practically replacing it with anything else besides buying a mm. new fabric. <clears throat> Yeah, that would obviously be the best choice because it's it's more breathable fabric. Of course, you can improvise with truck tarpaulins uh, that do not have that breathability. Um, so there is is a certain way to to improvise and and work around it. Um, but the really the the best choice would be to get a proper tent fabric. Yeah. And generally, you just want to avoid buying new things that are not like uh, manufactured in a scale that that's understandable to you or mm, yeah or, in, or in general i want to avoid avoid buying new things 
unless it's helping me to repair something, so new sewing machine needles or a new thread or um, or buying, I don't know, um, some, some things that help me make something myself. Um, so I think one could say that if I cannot justify the purchase of something new as some as it being beneficial for this the well-being of life in all its diversity, like or or beneficial at least for the survival of the human species, then I avoid buying it. Sometimes I'm um, not able to resist temptations, of course, so. Sometimes I buy new things if it's um, somehow, I don't know, affordable, reduced, or I, I, usually if I see something also on the flea market and I'm asking myself like, hmm, did I miss this yesterday? Um, and if I didn't miss it yesterday, then I wouldn't buy it. Mm. Yeah. Maybe we can zoom back a bit and talk about or zoom back or, or even zoom deeper in what's your or let's talk about your basic premises because uh, I imagine of course like some of those people can intuit from our conversation thus far but it would still be interesting in interesting to, to just like hear the starting points of how you view the world and our current situation in it can you elaborate a bit what you mean with premises? Like, uh, premises regarding the sustainability of our current civilization, or mm -hmm. mm. Uh, besides just stating that it's not sustainable. Okay, so like what is sustainable is basically defined by natural realities. So if if we use more than what we really, really need then it's not sustainable because it would be inefficient and inefficiency doesn't survive in nature. And nature is still the only place on earth or the only, I don't know, um, state of being even. And the, the word sustainability, when you break it down, it's the ability to sustain, right? So if you would claim something to be sustainable, it would mean that everybody could do it and it would not have an effect, a negative effect, right? So if you talk about sustainable aviation, if um, if it were really sustainable, then it would not be a problem if 8 billion people would use it, right? And quite often in the moment, I have the feeling that most part of the sustainability conversations that we have is about carbon, um, maybe pollution, um, but not so much on the general use of natural resources, fossil or regrowing. So, um, and when, when we look at the absolute minimum to the kind of the minimum level, the sufficiency level of sustaining our lives, including sustaining the planet or the well being of the natural ecosystems that we are surrounded and part of, then it's really down to taking care of the six survival priorities. So anything that goes beyond taking care of the six survival priorities, including taking detours like money or electricity, um, it's at least scratching on the sustainability um, or on the sufficiency levels. So like, <clears throat> Like a, a a very I think easy to understand picture for sustain understanding sustainability is if you have an apple tree that creates one apple every year, and by half of the year you have already eaten the apple, and you are still hungry for another apple, right? Then you cannot sustain your body for the rest of the year. Um, 
And in the moment, we are looking at the um, national or, or global overshoot days of the human population, like how much regrowing resources we use every year. It's close to eating, wanting to eat two apples every year, right? And that is not a possibility. So um, I, th I think I might need to go a bit deeper or into detail, um, maybe with a few further questions. Mm. Um, to to touch specific areas. At least one immediate follow up question is that how do you describe how it is possible that we currently are able to live in a way that overshoots? Well, we are not. We are not able but, to do that. But, but but in a sense, we are. That uh, that we can consume more resources that are sustainably available uh, yeah I mean I mean we cannot do it but we do it how do we do it we do it by over consuming what enables us to over consume mm, a lack of awareness I guess um, uh, lack of nature connection um, like I wouldn't say we are enabled, like, you know, we we slipped into, we were born into systems where certain behaviors were advertised legal and considered normal. So when I was born, it was, you know, a thing and totally okay to fly for holiday, right? Or to eat meat or go on cruise ships. So if in, in that sense, like what enables us to do it is like that, that this is what we have grown used to what we were brought up into um so it's it's our laws that come from gdp growth favoring uh times that that uh, allow us to behave in certain ways right you can you know it's you're you're allowed to to go with your car and stand by the traffic light and rub the engine right it's allowed um and that is an overconsumption. So I think the the lack of experienced consequences maybe makes us believe that we can do that. The situation is also that the effects are complex and unevenly distributed in both space and time mm -hmm. talk about that yeah i mean mm, when, when you say space and time i i somehow need to think about this so-called circle of awareness and circle of disturbance which i think is something that we can take from wilderness survival into let's say humankind survival um, and the idea is that pretty similar to what happens when you throw a pebble or a rock in the water, you get these ripples and waves like spreading in usually concentric rings around this point of impact. And when it's a windy day, they might disappear sooner. Or if it's a rainy day, those waves, you cannot notice them anymore after some time. And when it's like a calm day, those waves, they might carry really far away over the lake. And um, in this very similar way, we have always these two circles around us. Uh, one is called the circle of awareness, and one is called the circle of disturbance. So um, circle of awareness is basically how deep into your surrounding do you notice, right? If you, if you have your ears open, you have your senses trained, you have maybe use binoculars, um, you, 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 I don't know, walk barefoot, you just get a lot of information from your surroundings the area in which you notice can be quite big, right? Whereas if you would ride with a motorbike and have a helmet on, maybe music on your ears, uh, adrenaline pumping in your body, and you drive through the forest, then your circle of awareness, how deep into the area around you, you do notice that area is quite small. Um, the circle of disturbance behaves the same way. It's basically how far how big is the area around you in which you can be noticed by other animals? So if you drive with the motorbike, there's also a time 
component there. So even after you're gone, you can still be heard, you can still be smelled, and there will still be a visible tracker disturbance and impact on the ground, right? Uprooted bushes, yes, a deeper track as if from a barefoot walker. So this circle of disturbance, um, like it, you can you can play with those, right? You can you can make the circle of disturbance smaller than the circle of awareness, right? If you move silently and and take care of what smells you take with you, what noises you make, how fast you move, uh, what colors you wear, and so on, and and how much you use your senses then the circle of awareness can be easily bigger than the circle of disturbance, which would allow you to experience the rest of nature around you behaving in so-called baseline, right? Other animals are not disturbed by you, they behave normally, they don't even maybe notice you. Um, Whereas if the circle of disturbance is bigger than the circle of awareness, then you don't even see other animals running away, right? Because they have gone long before you come. Um, and when you think about wilderness survival, um, and we, later we need to build a bridge uh, there, when you think about wilderness survival and think about our ancestors, how they managed to survive here in the subarctic or in this area that only our species calls the subarctic, um, that they survived here, our presence is the evidence of that, right? They at least survived long enough to reproduce once. Um, they managed to do that by noticing dangers before danger notices them. Uh, they noticed food sources before the food source runs away, right? Or, or somebody else gets it. So it's kind of before ambulances and health systems, that was the health insurance, right? To always have the circle of awareness, ideally always to have it bigger than the circle of disturbance. And I would argue that this has not changed, right? Wilderness is still the only, well, nature is still the only place on earth. And, and wherever we sit right here in the studio, we have two or three kilos of other organisms inside of our bodies and, and, our, and our skin that behave totally wild, right? So we are, we are the minority of those here in the room who are not behaving wild. And um, so I, I think that this, circle of awareness circle of disturbance method not method it's 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 a i don't know image or something that this still applies right so nowadays we can notice far into space yeah we can also notice deep into the oceans but also our disturbance is reaching really far there right we have a lot more disturbance than awareness of what's going on in the oceans we have a lot of uh, awareness, but also disturbance in, in the space around our planet. Um, and of course, in city life, like our circle of awareness might be just the headphones on our ears or, or the next, next task that we are on. Um, and I think that if a lifestyle has this possibility to have these two circles in mind, then there is a strong likelihood that we would also get sustainability levels into uh, into levels that are sufficient. And I don't, I don't know if I'm making sense. Like, mm -hmm. mm. I need to drink something. Mm. Yeah, I'm thinking what it means because we are so omnipresent in many places on this planet. For example, in Finland, that that the circle of disturbance is really wide, and it's not easily, in general, it's not easily controllable by any individual human being because we, as communities and as society, are. For example, if you think about light pollution as an example we just like emit light pollution and there's nothing that most of us are able to do i, I occasionally like uh just like i don't know if, if fantasize is the correct word but but i've been 
imagining like shooting a couple of lamps uh, <laughs> uh, near where I live because there's a wonderful uh, call, what's the word kallio in, in English? Rocks. Well, just r- rocks. Lovely rocks uh, that w- would uh, make for uh, an optimal place for gazing the stars. There's not like that much light pollution when you compare it to what Helsinki is generally like. But there are a couple of lamps, just like a handful of lamps that really like uh, prevent that use of the place or, mm. or that don't prevent yeah. but but really like reduce the stargazing mm. ability yeah. <laughs> of the place. And uh, yeah, it's like the 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 circle of disturbance is so taking so many forms in in today's society and uh, a lot of it's related to how the machine just keeps running yeah like uh, also noise pollution like also underwater noise pollution you know take take a ferry take a train um you have so much noise pollution that is not really in your hand other than saying okay i'm taking the bicycle um or a walk or something or not not you know just stay in my area right um yeah some of the things are really hard to impact um by the way if you if you shoot the lights what would be your tool for doing that i think i haven't gotten that concrete because i imagine the most efficient way anyway would not be to, to shoot them and I've also just thought about diplomatic solutions as like trying to figure out if there's some party to contact, like the owner of those houses, uh, and for example, inquiring whether there could be some sort of motion mm. detection system or yeah. something that puts out the lights. I mean, a, lo- a lot is happening in that direction, right? You have like a lot of street lights that are now shielded from from um, polluting Above. light upwards, yeah, yeah. for example. Or that have motion sensors also. I actually never realized that, like blocking uh, the light above uh, until two days ago when my wife mentioned that mm. that's something that's done. I, yeah. I've seen them, but I never realized that that's enough. Um, by the way, in you know Earth Hour, uh-huh. uh, once a year, um, I think it's last sep- last Saturday in March or something, um, where all over the world, I think from. 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. people are encouraged to switch off the lights and this earth hour has been going on for i think two three decades already so it's not a new thing um and now we have a couple of years now uh been going around town in UN so and been switching off these light advertisements right these uh you know what you have on shops those signs um because after you know eight o'clock the shops are closed nobody is there and so there you can most of these lights they have a switch outside that is available from a public space it's a legal gray zone um, because those switches are there for emergencies which one could argue we are in or i think we can easily argue we are in an emergency and so when you switch off these lights it's it's actually helpful also for the shop owners and and some of the lights they have not been noticed that they are switched off and they have been off now for three years <laughs> so it's um yeah quite quite a nice one yeah. mm. oh just uh continuing with the fantasizing sidetrack here what would you shoot the lamps with um probably i wouldn't shoot them anymore myself I also wouldn't, you know, ask others to do it. I mean, I, I, I because I think that it's an approach of pushing and and blaming yeah. and shaming. I don't yeah. know. Uh, I'm, I'm not so keen on this approach of activism anymore. So I rather pull and invite to come along. Uh, I find that it's a lot more sustainable way of changing, and um, a lot more inviting, and and doesn't react. Uh, it doesn't cause these strong counter reactions um or yeah kind of it, it doesn't feed the opposition so to speak right um and yeah uh, just just a good one is ice cubes because they melt away so you're not leaving a project <laughs> with fingerprints <laughs> mm. and if you mix uh, sawdust into the water then they're getting actually really 
really solid. Uh, you can actually um, glue uh, arrowheads to the arrow shaft with uh, water and sawdust mixtures. It's a very solid winter glue, very strong, pretty good. Hmm. Interesting. But yeah, of course, that's like in no way a practical thing. It's more just like an emotional reaction and like yeah, thinking of like knee jerk reaction ways of of dealing with the problem. But um, but it's nice to have that sort of. Uh, break stuff fantasies occasionally but okay like to get back to the circles of disturbance so basically like is your statement that when the circles of disturbance are just so large it's not possible to have a sustainable way of living or sustainable ways of living mm, I, I think in the moment the the main challenge for us is to actually not reach sustainable levels of living right now but to find sustainable ways of changing there right to to have a sustainable transition because we don't really know from experience or from what our parents show have shown us what a survivable or a sustainable lifestyle looks like so we need to figure that one out um, and the big question is maybe not what exactly is that right because it can look in so you know it can be how to say it can be realized in so many different ways depending on the circumstances so um, like for example i have the privileged opportunity to live in a yurt Right, which is not a possibility for many, many other people. Right, so it's not a scalable um, solution in itself. But the questions I'm asking myself that brought me there, the questions and tools that I would consider sustainable. Right, so the the motivation for change, the the reasons, the yeah, there of course also certain ways of change can be sustainable. So, um, right, for example, like uh, I find it a very sustainable question: um, what is enough? Right, the question "what is enough" it's such a good guidance question that just having this question is already a, a good promise for reaching sustainability. Because sustainability is sufficiency, actually. Like, um, and in the in the moment, I'm very concerned that we are using the word sustainable or sustainability too too easily, right? We call something sustainable uh, only might be because uh, the carbon footprint is neutral, right? Um, or, or we call something sustainable because it's good for marketing. Um, well, I think that whenever we use the word sustainable, we should be able to say, like, well, maybe I say it the other way around. If we are not able to say that this is high level, 100% sustainable, then we shouldn't use the word sustainable. Right? We can We can talk about this is more sustainable, um, at the same time, that is not necessarily a reason to do it, right? For example, uh, uh, let's say a super yacht with some solar panels on it is more sustainable than a super yacht without solar panels on it. Is a super yacht ever sustainable? Unlikely, right? These uh, super yacht, big people, big rich people ships, right? Those. So I, I don't think it ever can be sufficiently sustainable. And and so the um, this quest of making things more sustainable is not always a good idea, right? Like you know, it's 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 basically calling something sustainable that is just less harmful, you know, a tiny bit less harmful, but still causing harm, mm. or or calling something climate friendly, you know, if it's just less 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 harmful. But still, right? So, you know, you'd call a, 
electric car may be carbon friendly or climate friendly. But to me, friendly means actually friendly, right? <laughs> it, it means like supporting, uh, good for the well-being to, to, to repair things, to make things better and not just to cause less harm. Um, so I think we need to be a bit more careful in our language. Hmm. Yeah, I guess, because I started thinking that you are using the word sustainability in a more absolute sense than people generally maybe use it in a relative sense. But of course, like even what appears to me as absolute sustainability is not necessarily absolute because like uh, if you zoom out to a long enough time scale, it might become evident that some things that seemed sustainable uh, from one like from one vantage point is actually not that but but it's like uh, it appears to me that what you're like looking for here is just like something that we can practically see as sustainable now and not that it has to be sustainable forever and that's also connected to you not wanting to uh, promote any one solution to all the, all the problems but more like yeah i'm happy on. to promote gateways mm -hmm. um solutions are ideally individual tailor-made to to fit own life realities um yeah like there there are things that you know we we might consider as you said in in some perspective or in some point in life or some time that we might call something sustainable um ultimately what is really sustainable is defined by the natural world and and i think that is not taking more than we absolutely need and not you know, kind of also whatever we take that we give it back in a way that others can still use it right that we are not creating toxic waste kind of giving back more than what we took um and I also think that a sustainable lifestyle is a lifestyle where like the purpose is is kind of in line with with the demands of of our planet which um you know like we 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 like to look at is it sustainable to feed the human community for example right can we can we make more of this and this kind of certain i don't know so-called sustainable aviation fuels for example um because we we think like yes we humans we have this demand to fly right we have this this is one of our wants and this is we take it as a given that this is part of our reality that we will have to fly around also in the future so we are looking at how can we make those sustainable aviation fuels that in my opinion should not be called sustainable aviation fuels um and we are not looking at does it actually serve the planet right is it is it just less harmful for the planet and allows more of us humans to fly also in the future or to it allows for the few humans who actually fly because it's not that many humans who actually do fly um that they can also f fly in the future so this is what we are looking at when we are looking at sustainable fuels we are not looking at does it restore ecosystems for example which you know would be an angle that should be included in sustainability is like does it actually fix stuff that we have fucked up previously um does it help ecosystems does it help um biodiversity right and if it does not help biodiversity then i think it's not sustainable i'm finding myself thinking about only taking what we need and the definitions of need would you say that we as a species have a need to experiment with our borders or our limitations yeah i mean that's that's something that is maybe the most unique about the human species compared to other species is that we are looking to push limits that we are looking to 
extend boundaries um to to i don't know reach higher fire uh, higher or faster or i don't know um more bizarre or whatever um so i think that's quite a sustainable uh, not a, a quite quite a human thing to do um um, at the same time, when we look at the real needs, it's shelter, food, water, air, health, and community. That Those are our needs, right? As a naked-born human, this is what you need to stay alive, to take care of those six survival priorities. Um, if I would... You know, when, you, when, when I listen to some prognosis on how traffic will develop in the next 20 years, then I hear people say, well, people will also need to drive to work in 20 years. People will need to go, you know, will need cars to take care of their hobbies and people will need cars to um, do their shopping. Is it a need to do shopping or is it a need to feed yourself, right? Is it a need to have hobbies that require, I don't know, um, heating of big sports halls in the winter and, and freezing sports halls in the summer for ice hockey in the summer. Is that a need? Right, Hobbies might be a need as part of community and health. The question is like what, how, how do we um, try to fulfill those needs? Are those, how to say, I'm trying to say that not everything that we want is something that we actually can want, right? So the, the, the needs that we think we have, they do not match with the possibilities of the natural world. So, right, like uh, as an example, if, if, I, if I'm guiding a group uh, and I'm looking, you know, for, for a place where we can cross a river with the group, um, I might ask the group to wait and I will scout a few places where it's safe to cross the river or where it's easy to cross the river. And if, if everybody in the group is like, you know, really good climber and, and, and confident swimmer, then we can cross the river in a lot more different places, right? Where we can climb the steep bank on the other side and where we uh, can also, you know, swim if the water is getting too deep. Uh, if, however, somebody in the group is um, limited in their mobility, we will have different needs as a group as to where we can cross the river. So, and, and I think that if, if the group would say, but we, we all need to cross the river with dry feet, right? It's not really a need, right? It's something that might be wishful, uh, it might be nice to be able to cross the river with dry feet, um, but it's not really a necessity, right? You can you can um, walk through a river and and uh, dry your shoes later, or you can um, you know I don't know put plastic bags around your boots if you have them, or you know there's there's ways to like it's it's not a realistic need. Right, you, you can't say that, okay, but we want to have dry feet because then maybe nobody can cross the river. So this, the natural reality of the river being wet and there is something we need to deal with and then we need to adjust our needs accordingly. Right, We can't adjust the river according to our needs. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, yeah. Sure. Yeah. But I'm thinking like there's... having hobbies or or going shopping or driving a car are more wants than needs and something that we take pleasure in perhaps but things such like the human drive towards experimenting with limitations is something that i'd more categorize in the need category even if the particular forms it take takes might not be a need so so i think like even if you prevented us in some context from taking more than what is absolutely necessary we would still in other contexts 
gravitate towards occasionally taking more that's absolutely necessary because I think that's just like our it's part of experimentation experimentation yeah. is necessary yeah. I mean we need to um, like so, mm -hmm. let's say we, we, we find it and we define it as a need to explore space right we we um, you know, if 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 some Elon Musk is going to some sub supplier and says, "But I need your raw materials for my rocket fuel, because we need to figure out how we can get to Mars," right? It's not really, really a need. It's a need in a context. It's like a need in a context. If your if your starting point is that we want to do it, it's a need in that context. Yeah. But not not like a profound survival yes. need. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I think the the uh, instinct for exploration is more like a, a closer to a survival need in a sense that it's so built in to us and also to other animals yes yeah uh, and 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 at the, uh, when I look at this need for exploration then I'm often wondering why are we exploring high tech more than low tech right um, because like um Like, like I, I can see the fascination, you know, with with exploring new technologies that we haven't had, that we, you know, experienced the thrill of engineering and um, and and exploring new technologies, um, and at the same time, we do not necessarily explore this kind of what is enough, right? This exploring the the high tech is more like, you know, what is the most somehow the we can get. Um, and the other exploration would be what is the least we can get by with. And what I do not understand is why we are not exploring this area more, because it's a lot easier and a lot more, you know, a lot, like it holds a lot more answered questions. Maybe one, one answer to that is precisely that it's a lot easier and, and some people gravitate towards complex challenges but of course it's also a re reality that learning to li live sustainably is a really complex challenge that would like offer inspiring projects for all I'm, of I'm not people. sure if it's such a complex challenge you know as, as a, not not necessarily in the scale of a human or, or or a small community but if you think about the whole civilization i would say it's complex because there's many uh, aspects that are in feedback loop, loop connection oh, 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 yes. with each other, oh, oh, and, and, and at the same time, like uh, the the complex societies are made of of, of individuals. You know, if if uh, we individuals take on the sustainability cha challenge uh, on our own, this is a society in itself will just go the same route. But actually, there there's something I want to challenge your thinking. Uh, because uh, I think it's not just in the hands of individuals. Mm. I think it's a, a feedback loop that goes both directions. That both systems, both systems and individuals affect each other in the way mm -hmm. that you cannot just start from one of them and expect the other to change. And I think like one example of this is the current like artificial intelligence uh, arms race where the situation is that even though some particular player in the field of AI development might not want to have an arms race where everyone is tr trying to get to the top as quickly as possible. Yeah, but somebody else is doing it, so you have no choice but get Yeah, go so I, I think there's a lot of that sort of dynamics mm -hmm. that make it difficult just for individuals to change mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. or, or that we would simultaneously need the change to happen in many levels mm -hmm. and uh, and that that's what that's what makes it complex yeah and 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 uh i think it's a, a challenge that we do have the potential probably to solve but i also think that it might take all of the potential that we do have <laughs> yes yes and sense. at the same time often it's like you know when you when you think of 
the impact of you know a 15 year old schoolgirl sitting in front of the Swedish Parliament, mm -hmm. you know Greta Thunberg and the climate strikes, very very simple individual action, huge impact, right? Um, so I, I think we should not underestimate the power that we have as individuals in, in that matter. Um, that being said, I totally see this this point of you know being stuck. Right. Uh, I, I know people in the super yacht community who totally agree that it's, you know, that there will never be a sustainable super yacht, that it's impossible. Right. They agree. And, and at the same time, they are, you know, feeding their family by painting super yachts and the shipyard together with 400 other workers. Um, so what can they do as individuals? Or even uh, I've once had a customer who was, uh, C I don't know if he was CEO back then. He said that he's on the managing uh, one of the managers of a big German car manufacturer, and he had uh, said after a five-hour wilderness trip with me that he he said that what his work actually is, and that um, from what he had just learned that it doesn't make sense for human survival to build new cars more to build more new cars. It doesn't make sense, he said, and at the same time in his position he cannot decide that from now on we don't produce cars anymore, even though he was in a very powerful position because, of course, this company is responding to, to the stock market, right? So um, the, the discrepancies between personal reality understandings and job descriptions, they might be huge. Um, and I think they are huge for probably more than more than half of the population that there is a discrepancy between what we understand and what we do or need to do or are somehow trapped in maybe and and still like i i think it's it's valuable to to have a ceo uh who at least has this question back in their head that this doesn't make sense does it because then once these kind of purpose questions, when they spread, then we will find ways and, and kind of they give the direction. So um, of course it's a, it's a huge thing to, to um, you know, expect from a car manufacturer not to produce as many cars as possible, but produce as, as few as possible and make them as lightweight and recycled and slow and powerful as just necessary compared to what currently the car market is selling. So Yeah, one challenging question related to that is that if there is a car manufacturer that is already doing their best in the in the realities of the, the market situation to try to steer the company towards more sustainability, like of course, you've talked about the problem of just going for more sustainable, but but if I imagine a person in that situation, if they tried to push too hard into the direction of radically transforming the way they're doing things, or even they decide to quit, then they can be certain that there will be will be someone else to take the yeah, niche. That's... And that yeah, that makes it really challenging. I'm also thinking like um what you were just talking about made me think about addictions and how one m big part of recovery from addiction tends to be finding new social contexts to live in. Because mm -hmm. if, if someone who is addicted to alcohol or other drugs just keeps on hanging with the same people, mm -hmm. it will decrease the likelihood yep. of them remaining sober. And uh, and this is probably one of the explanations for why people who, for example, start trying out like uh, low impact lifestyles find it really hard to sustain that because it might be really difficult for many of them to just not like being pulled back by the the life that many people are living. Yeah, and and there is, I mean, when you are. I mean that those times are in my experience luckily over that if you go in the direction of a sustainable lifestyle you used to be a pioneer right and and pioneering is is you know not necessarily as rewarding in terms of 
like you know people feel judged just by your existence almost right you come to a meeting and you have your bicycle helmet with you and and then people say oh sorry i came by car it's like okay um, i didn't ask right i don't care almost right of course i do care in a way because i'm you know affected by other people's lifestyle choices of course right um at the same time i you know i'm not judging people for for it and that's something that you know often you you get when you when you try something new that people feel judged or or um you're some kind of weirdo because you're doing something different right um and i think you know when you look at the right you don't need to explain in a supermarket anymore what a, a vegan yogurt is right they exist in the supermarket so um it's uh, i think a lot easier and, and and a lot more rewarding nowadays than it used to be so i i'm not sure if i share this what you said that uh that it's hard to hold on to it because you're drawn back because very often um it actually comes with the social circles right you're you you want to you know learn about vegan diet and then you find a blog and then you find that there is a you know vegan cooking club or or that uh you, you know you you meet your neighbor by the vegan counter in the supermarket and suddenly you're you know it's it's, it's a lot more supported a lot more accepted and and not frowned upon or yeah i i think it's 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 a lot easier nowadays hmm. i want to continue co the conversation from here but before that i want to take a slight detour and i want to you to explain a bit about the super yacht thing what's what's that about because okay. you mentioned it to me before but uh it's not like a community or or, or scene or whatever that i i know anything about so yeah can you explain okay so um mm. Hmm. Maybe it's it's a good moment to talk a bit about activism. So, I've been now with Greenpeace as an activist since I'm 16. Now I'm 43 years old, and I'm still active with Greenpeace. And I found that, um, like especially since I moved away from Helsinki, that I cannot engage with Greenpeace as much anymore. Or can I don't know. One could say that I cannot use Greenpeace as much anymore. Uh, you know, it was like kind of for me the biggest fire engine I could hop hop onto and take, you know, catch a ride with and put out big fires. Um, and it still is like, it, I think it's a very good organization. Um, and then when I moved away from Helsinki, I wanted to find out where I can do my kind of, I don't know, fulfill my activism desires or needs. And so when i um yeah then i engaged in social media i had facebook which was too stressful for me and then i thought okay let's let's go to the extremes of i don't know like uh let's go to the money world right and then i went to linkedin which is kind of the professional social media network where i feel like money rules more than in other social media networks and I wanted to just for curiosity. I wanted to see what are the topics, what are the questions, uh, are there other um, green voices, let's say, um, in this LinkedIn network, and and what what topics are on the table. And then inside this LinkedIn network, I thought, okay, let's go to the other extremes. Like you know, from my understanding and i went uh into you know followed car manufacturers followed the private jet community and went into the super yacht community um strategically uh, it was mostly curiosity because i you know th thought that okay i can change quite easily in my life because my you know footprints aren't big anyway um but how is it for for people who who have big footprints, right? Um, how easily can they change? So I wanted to dive deeper into the super yacht community and have nowadays grown quite some good connections and have like quite interesting conversations. Um, um, yeah, and 
it is really interesting. So I'm a member of the Oceans Cafe, which is uh, like a meeting once a week, uh, like just a, a Zoom meeting for 45 minutes once a week. It's connected to Switzerland for the oceans. Um, a lot of people from the super yacht community, but they're also, um, it's quite a diverse group. So there's like marine biologists, there's someone from Sea Shepherd in that, in this group. So it's like, um, yeah, a, a group of people who, who see that the super yacht community has to do better and that they can do better. Um, and they look at possible handprints, like how, how to make the handprints of the community bigger and the footprint smaller. Um, also, this Oceans Cafe is like a platform where, um, for example, connections can be made in terms of project funding um, for for scientific research or social projects. So very interesting community in the moment there is the uh, monaco yacht show going on in monaco um and i i'm not sure if i i i had an invitation to go to monaco next year i'm not sure if i want to <laughs> it's far away um but yeah it's it's i'm, I'm actually quite uh, impressed that they're they're even open for well they i mean there's really no us and them right because uh the super commu super yacht community where does it start where does it end right is it is it you know the the worker who is doing the electricity lines that you know provides power to the shipyards where does it start where does it end i don't know what's the definition is it just size a size thing thing or what well the and what, what exactly is a yacht actually what okay a super different? yacht i think super yachts are anything over 50 meters and there are mega yachts that are over 100 meters um, most of them are motorized so uh, jeff bezos now has a super yacht that is uh, sail powered um but it has a support vessel <laughs> you know it has a big ship that is just supporting that is run by on, on motors um so um yeah they usually have swimming pools helicopter landing pads cinemas uh spas saunas um like what's the relationship be between a, a yacht and a cruise boat or because i don't know anything about okay that. so like if you compare let's say the viking line cruise ships that go from turku to stockholm a super yacht is about five times smaller and five times more expensive. Just to, you know, give give some some idea about dimensions. Uh, it's something that is um, kind of the reasons to have super yachts is for the wealthy people who might be followed by paparazzi to have a space where they can actually relax with their families. Uh, it's a status symbol, of course. Uh, so it's a prestige thing is something where you can have like meetings with your business partners or future business partners, whatever. Uh, a lot of those super yachts, they're used maybe one week per year. And most of the time they're just on standby with full crew on board. Uh, like the biggest ones, they might have a crew of 30 for 12 passengers or something. So it's really high end luxury um, by previous luxury terms like i wouldn't call it luxury like not at all like i think luxury is you know when you walk barefoot in the bog and pick berries <laughs> like that is luxury like you know on a warm spring day when you can find the the cranberries that have survived under the snow and you walk in this you know warm moist moss and and there is no mosquitoes around yet and you can you can walk in the bog on these floating bog islands, you know, in the spring floods, those bog islands might be a bit floating and that is real luxury, I think. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So what else do you want to know about super yachts? Just a small follow-up question. Do you think you would be able to find luxury if you, you, you found yourself on a super yacht? I think for me, the luxury from my personal perspective would mostly be to have the opportunity to observe 
like if I would be on a super, I would like to be invisible, <laughs> you know, just just you know be there and observe and 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 try to understand the the situation the people on board are in, um, like how they feel about this, like yeah. Um, Like the the Greenpeace ships, they are registered as yachts, right? That that's the marine register is is like you know like you can register your camper van as a truck or something, or or your van as a camper. I don't know. Like and and the Greenpeace ships, they are registered as yachts, and in my opinion, they are kind of super yachts because they're actually doing super stuff, <laughs> right? So um, and. One Greenpeace ship, um, like the Arctic Sunrise, um, it has uh, has a sauna. It, it used to be a Russian exploring ship, so it had a built-in sauna. And for me to you know sit in the sauna is always a luxury. And then sitting in a sauna on a ship that is on a good mission, sure, that's luxury also. Um, maybe that's the closest I've ever come to super yacht luxury in my life. And once again, I'm thinking about if I'm derailing too much into details, but that might not be interesting for everyone, but also this is a podcast springing from my curiosity. So what is a yacht and what's, what di distinguishes a yacht from something that is not a yacht? Mm. Yacht, yacht, how do you pronounce it? Whatever. Hmm. I think the purpose, um, the size, the build, um, you know, like they're not designed to be sufficient, right? They're designed to be the whole opposite of sufficient, right? They they have, you know, engines that are so powerful that they can go really fast for, for a boat of that size, right? Um, they have, you know, I don't know, really expensive furniture, teak floors, uh, made of teak wood, um, or yeah, very expensive features. It's really, it's about the, I don't know, I would almost say senseless use of money. Um, I don't know what, def what, when do you call something a mm. yacht? Um, but it's still obvious that it's, or I don't know if it's obvious, but but I'm thinking that it probably counts among some of the most complex objects that people build. No, not really that complex. I mean, like, not really that complex. Like, I think there are a lot more complex things. Of course, you know, the engines might be more complex or the, yeah. Like in comparison, of course, you know, like there was a time where a toaster was complex. So it's... Uh... But okay, you, you find... I want to hear a bit more about like the sort of resonant places you find in your communication with them regarding or related to your your life's purpose. Mm. So... Like strategically, I think the super yacht community is very interesting area. Like when you when you think about, have you might have heard that to to bring change, three percent of the population need to be in for it, and then you can start a movement kind of thing. I don't know if this three percent rule holds up to to it. I don't know. Um, when I look at the the size of the super yacht community, it's relatively small. We are talking like I don't know, a couple of thousand ships per on the whole planet. It's not really that much, um, and I might be even wrong on these numbers. It's really kind of a relatively small community. This, um, so when I look at the impact of this community, um, there are several impacts. Of course, like there is a claim of yes uh, there's a lot of employment because of this industry or this community right a lot of people work on shipyards work on ships um, and people supply 
um, you know, food in the harbors to those ships. Um, so they they do employ people. That's a impact that they claim as a positive. Um, I would say that these are people that are kept from doing purposeful work, right? So, um, and other impact is that there is this uh, kind of trickle down argument that uh, the 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 money that these super yachts enable money to be brought to poor communities, remote island communities, for example, because they're visited by the super yachts, so money is coming to those islands. Not an argument that holds up in times where you can do wireless money transfer, right? So you don't need a super yacht to bring money to poor communities. Um, so the super yachts have, of course, relatively high impact when you look at footprint per user, yeah, compared to, I know, uh, a, a cruise ship, right? You have a lot more users on the ship. Of course, the, sh the ship is bigger, makes more emissions than a smaller super yacht but it's more distributed over more users. Um, not saying that a, sh a cruise ship could ever be sustainable, right? Um, so when I look at the strategical reason or potential, let's say, to approach the super yacht community and look at the other impacts of the community, like, um, you know, it's, it's the, the high society in previous terms, in, in my opinion, there's like an uh, old status quo where people who use super yachts are called high society. Um, and then they are, you know, shown in, in television, shown in movies, shown in, um, I don't know, uh, yellow press pictures that the rich people are using those super yachts and private jets and fancy cars and jewelry and big up, big penthouse suites in New York and whatever is considered as luxury and make uh, holidays in luxury resorts. And then people look up to this and also want some of that. So when I then look at, you know, a huge community, not the super yacht community, like somewhere uh, I'm using air quotes lower than the super yacht community, they want some of this, but they cannot, of course, afford a super yacht, but maybe they can afford to go on a cruise ship, right? Or maybe they cannot afford uh, five Ferraris, but maybe they can afford a second car. Or maybe they cannot afford a huge villa, but they can maybe, uh, you know, then dream dream up to, to live in a bigger apartment. So when, when this status symbol of super yacht, as an example, is there out in the open, it uh, has a effect on others which then actually makes the biggest impact like negative footprints so um like like cruise ships have a much bigger environmental impact than super yachts because a lot more people use them they're a lot bigger there are a lot more of those so and i think that the super yacht community could have an impact on you know, if, if, if this community would say, whoops, we were wrong, this is not luxury, right? We, we try to get out of this. We, we also understand that it's not, it's not sensible, not useful, not, um, not in the interest of our own survival to have five Ferraris, right? Then this can have a huge effect when it's depicted in movies and the media uh, and told in our stories that it has this impact that less people want to go on a on a cruise ship cruise or less people want to fly for holiday or less people want to because it's not considered as you know something you might want to achieve anymore so and inside this community of course you have people who you know just like you might see as a traffic light somebody revving their cars the engines of their cars there are members or, or people in the super yacht community who really don't give a shit, right? Or there are people who, who don't know how to give a shit. Or like, right, they, are, they might be trapped in their circumstances and might not feel that they have a power to change things. And of course, there are also people like with, now I'm, uh, that was a surprise for me when I got in contact with this community that there are people who say, no, 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 this is not good. Right, we we realize that things need to change dramatically. We need to have, we need to work 
on our sustainability. And we do understand that there is no such thing as a sustainable super yacht. So, and and this, you know, if you if you look at trying to get three percent from the whole global community or get three percent of the super yacht community, you know, it's a lot less people that kind of need to get moving to have a potentially quite high impact. So that's yeah, quite interesting also. Hmm. Okay, where did we arrive from? We were talking about the complexity of change and we were talking about why people are not focusing more on low tech, like explore, exploration. And questions related to how challenging the transformation is that you're, you're talking about. I was thinking at some point, I would say how surprisingly unchallenging, unchallenging it is. Mm -hmm. It's my perspective by mm. now. Yeah. I was thinking before when we were talking about inheriting lifestyles from our parents and the abnormality of of humans amongst species on this planet that currently we are not like uh, able to inherit or copy the lifestyle of our parents uh, and trust them to be sustainable and i found myself thinking about uh, i don't know if you know Theravaden, mm, i have met him yes yeah um, i don't know what he is uh, saying or what um yeah, I find that amazing. He's talking about a lot of the same things as you. He's focused quite a bit on fossil fuels and the impact they've had on the trajectories that our society has taken. And he's very much thinking into thinking about sustainability. But uh, yeah, one point of view that has remained with me that Terra brought up was that even though we have a lot of knowledge in our current society, uh, we even have knowledge of complex systems, but, but he just... Uh, brought up the idea that if we imagine, for example, an indigenous culture that for uh, whatever reasons lost their way of living sustainably, even though we have all sorts of information, some of which is like integrated or, or a lot of understanding on many aspects of the world, we probably wouldn't be able to tell such a society how to get back to living mm. sustainably and that's i think that's like in many ways uh clarifying to, to think about that that even if we think about like smaller societies that are a lot smaller than us of course yeah we could encourage them to experiment in the way that you're for example experimenting with more sustainable ways of living but how to actually how how an intergenerational an intergenerationally sustainable community emerges mm. is not something that can be taught from the outside probably mm. and i'm not even sure if it can be taught from the inside uh -huh, um, yeah like as you said, we do have access to an unbelievable amount of information, right? Through our museums, libraries, universities, there's so much knowledge and information there. Even wisdom. Even wisdom, but wisdom is a bit harder to find in the universities than knowledge. Wisdom is, in general, maybe a bit harder to find than yes. knowledge. Yes, and... And when I look at, for example, our society, who used to be indigenous here in some place, like we are not indigenous in, I don't know, the term is maybe a bit complicated in this context. Um, like when you mention intergenerational, like when when my mother grew up, and she was a child, she had to take care of other children, right? 
uh, when I grew up, I didn't have to take care of other children. Um, and so when my son was born, he was the first baby's diaper I've ever had to change, right? It was like a totally new terrain for me. And, and I think that also when I look at where the wisdom usually is in our societies, like there has been research done that shows that people who have harder life conditions, right, who are living in poorer communities, that there is more wisdom there than in in the well of uh, luxury, easy life, well earners, like the the bigger earners. They are there's not that much wisdom there in comparison. Then there's also more wisdom in older people than in younger people usually because they've had more time to accumulate wisdom and and um, make experiences in their life which caused them to have wisdom. Um, and now we have societies where this is not mixed, right? We have the young people quite separated from the old people, um, right? We're not having communities anymore where old and or very old and very young are living together. Um, there are some uh, interesting thing. I don't remember the town somewhere in the Netherlands. Um, the uh, there was a um, children care home, uh, like a kindergarten or daycare place, and the elder care home. Yeah, and and one of them needed to be renovated. So they they put the two together just for some time of the renovation, and then figured out okay, this is beneficial for everyone. So they they kept it mixed, right? They kept the very young kids with the very old people, and I think this is where a lot of wisdom transfer can happen. Also in the old people care homes, you might have rich and poor mixed in the same place. Um, and and I'm, I'm just talking money rich, money poor, not happiness rich or happiness poor or something. So, um, and, I, and I think that this is something to just have in mind that when we want to get our societies and I think we should want, because it would be stupid not to want it, uh, kind of back on track, right? Back into sustainable levels. Part of the sustainability is also to have the sustainable community in terms of, for example, wisdom, knowledge transfer about interaction of taking care of each other. So if, if I would now go to this example of, you know, you said this indigenous community that have somehow lost their ways is like, it needs to start by putting the community back together and and start the sustainability in you know by by having a community that has kind of sustainable ways of interacting with each other like not necessarily sustainable in no plastic no carbon but sustainable in terms of let's say traditions interactions um you know that we eat together that we greet each other that we you know that these little elements that make community um and i think once we repair our communities in terms of connection then the rest can easily follow along and if we fail to do so then i'm not sure if there's much hope even to to reach kind of this higher goal of of a community living as a unity, a sustainable lifestyle. I find myself often thinking about how one challenge related to the emergence of community comes from us not obviously needing each other in the sense that in today's society is at least seemingly easy to survive without depending directly on, on people in your uh, immediate community. So of course, it's not actually that you survive without other people, but it's just that the, the infrastructure that brings in your needs is much more complex and harder mm. to understand, mm. like where the things that sustain you come from mm. and that when I when I think about because I referred before to people finding it hard to to start living a more simple, more sustainable life. I've heard so many stories about people trying to 
form communities and people just not committing long term. And mm. I think one reason for that it is that it's just too, in a sense, too easy to to go away when you start encountering challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our history, communities have probably generally emerge out of necessity from people really needing each other for immediate survival mm -hmm. and uh, because we can sort of like uh, cover our immediate survival needs by going to the supermarket and renting an apartment somewhere that that's like one of the challenges that stands in the way that people find it easier to commit when you have to commit if you if you die if you don't commit then the option is like uh, or or the choice is much mm. clearer yeah th that is how it appears that's not how it is like like of course you do need the farmer right um you know you yes the supermarket food just appears and the supermarket and you don't you know even need the person at the casa anymore because there's even a casa machine nowadays so it it seems like you you're quite needless in terms of other people um at the same time whatever the community does impacts your survivability so if our right if if um let's say you know, X amount of people choose to eat cheap meat that is fed by grain or corn or soy or whatever that is grown where there used to be rainforest and because of that rainforests are being slash burned. So you have like the Amazon on fire because of um, some meat eaters, right? It is impacting you and and it you basically need other people not to eat meat, right? You have a need a dependency on other people and when when you say it like the survival priorities are covered right you have a shelter you have this apartment you have uh, food from the supermarket when you really look into this like like for example the survival priority food right food it needs to be sufficient in terms of energy uh vitamins like the whole nutrient list needs to be covered so that it can sustain your body um when we are looking again at the slightly bigger picture oh, well going a little bit back um I, I like to bring this pizza example the frozen pizza where there's tuna on top of the pizza so you might earn your money to pay for your food by sitting on a desk and pushing buttons right like on a keyboard in a computer so you might do this like um sit there in the office or home office eight hours per day um two of these eight hours go to pay for shelter finnish average is about 26 percent of our income goes into paying for our shelter like apartments mortgages so that's two hours every day from an eight hour work day just they're gone for the shelter so you have the remaining six hours where you know some of that goes into your food so without having used much calories on your work day sitting by the desk and pushing buttons depending on what you do depending if you need more or less brain for doing your work you will have e expanded certain amount of calories then you can drive home um just by sitting in a car maybe and and uh, pushing some buttons and steering the steering wheel and then you can uh, push a shopping trolley around the supermarket push some buttons at the cashier and at home you um, put the pizza in the oven and push some buttons and voila there's your food and in this from the money that you have earned in this day you can buy a lot more calories than what you will even need in a whole week right it's it's unbelievable how how cheap energy rich food is yeah so in in our society like even the low income groups have problems with obesity which is kind of a, a, a new thing in terms of history right it used to be that the very poor people they were almost starving right nowadays it's like really cheap to buy um buy buy a lot of energy rich food so when you then look at this the survival priority food again the energy input output it needs to be positive right you need to get more energy back from your food than what you personally invested to get the food 
If you look at the hunter-gatherer setup, which most of our ancestors have been hunter-gatherer or semi-nomadic hunter-gatherer communities, you would immediately feel if your hunt is not successful, right? If you have been like we are, we are persistent hunters. We are, our speciality is that we are the fastest mammal over the distance on Earth, right? There are mammals that are faster but not long distance, and there are mammals that are uh, more enduring on the distance but not as fast as we are. So um, our way of hunting was the persistent hunt like uh, many thousands of years before we even had projectile weapons we could already hunt other animals just by hunting them down just by running them down because we could sweat we could carry water we have like two legs on the ground less friction we can communicate and hunt in a group so like we can outrun even other animals that are faster than we are because they need to stop to cool down and um, so eventually you, you would catch up with them. So if, if this hunt would not be successful, right, you have just used, you know, a whole day of running and you would not catch anything, you would feel that. When you're doing like one or two weeks of wilderness living, you will feel that your body is getting weaker if you're not getting the energy in that you use. So, and over time, of course, it's getting lighter, weaker, less resistant. Uh, you are more tired, you sleep less well, you make more mistakes. So it's like really, you can easily see this deficiency in energy input. When we are now looking back at our modern hunter-gatherer, when you hunt for the food in the supermarket and then look at the tuna pizza that comes from your oven, you might have the feeling that, yeah, sure, I get more calories back than what I invested because I was only sitting around and pushing buttons and steering some wheels. The calculation, however, is not starting when you put the pizza in the oven, right? Or when you buy it, the, the calculation starts, this energy input calculation starts when we outsource the work, the energy, the resources to some other places. So, you know we need energy and resources but let's talk only energy to to build the the uh, ship the yard where the fishing vessel was built in the first place then the tuna needs to be caught processed uh the the seafarers need to be you know fed and paid um like the fisher people um the the tuna will need to be processed stored transported sold packaged all these kind of things that add up to this energy input calculation which we personally do not feel so when we look with these eyes on the food in a finnish supermarket then you will find that there's not a single food item in a finnish supermarket where this energy input output calculation is positive which means the energy, uh, the, the survival priority food is not covered in a sufficiently sustainable way. And if the survival, if any of the survival priorities is not suffi sufficiently taken care of, then we qualify for being in a survival situation. And so the, the picture you just painted, where you, we feel disconnected from others, it's really just how it appears. It is mm -hmm. not how it is. Yeah, and that's the way I perceive it too. And it's very difficult to find your way out of that situation for many people. I know that you say that it was easy for you, but you've also said that you your the context uh, to me what I know of your your personal life's history, the whole context of your life has sort of pointed you to this direction, and I, I find myself suspicious regarding how easy it's for other people. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I'm totally biased. I'm also extremely privileged, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I inherited some money that allowed me to buy the yurt, mm -hmm. right? Without that, I could not have gone that route, for mm -hmm. example. Um, my experience, however, is that in, in general, like when I, for example, um, like organize solos, like solo wilderness experiences, and wouldn't call them vision quests quite yet, um, but solo experiences is that people who come to me want often to experience their the edges of their comfort zones. And like my job as a guide is then to to find out where they actually are, because I wouldn't actually want that 
participants actually reach these edges because then you have a whole lot of aftermath to take care of right in terms of avoiding trauma and or dealing with trauma and and uh it's it you know a lot of things can happen once you cross the comfort zones my experience is however that the edge of the comfort zone is not where we think that it is right once we are there we realize that oh actually it's not here right it's it's still a bit further right so and and also when i look at this let's say adventure of of um pursuing higher levels of sustainability in a personal lifestyle these adventures we we will find out that things are actually easier than we thought right also it plays a big role what kind of narratives we have in our head if if we have in our head that okay um if i give up the car and the meaty diet that will be good right it will then i will be more sustainable uh, so if we act out of this kind of feeling of necessity, if we act out of this, with this narrative of reducing or giving up something, then we might find it really challenging. If we approach this whole thing with a different why, right? So, you know, the like give up your car, give up your meaty diet. This is like what you can do. If If we start with like why I want to do things, and then I find out that hmm, something I could do is I could actually upgrade to a lifestyle without a car, right? So very often I believe that what what we perceive as the edge of our comfort zone is really a matter of perspective, right? Um, I maybe want to give another example, like. When I was at university, I was working in a hiking store. Like my my st student job was, you know, selling backpacks and hiking shoes and and tents and whatnot. And I had a lot of access to good gear, either borrowed or I get it for the wholesale price. You know, what is it wholesale? No, the retail. Well, yes, what the you know for for you know forty, fifty, sixty percent cheaper the products. So I was really, really well equipped, and I once crossed the Alps from Germany to Italy with a thirty-something kilo backpack. You know, I was young and unexperienced and strong, and thirty kilo backpack was okay. And I thought it was a manly thing to carry heavy backpack, and 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 just the empty backpack alone was three kilos, right? After this trip, I decided that this was not the biggest pleasure I could have and I wanted to go with a lighter backpack. So I went this route of like, how can I make my backpack lighter, similar to how can I make my lifestyle more sustainable? So I you know, made this backpack lighter by starting to make my own gear, right? I made tarps and sleeping bags myself from lighter materials or, you know, lighter designs. Um, you know, I cut off the edges of maps and the handles of toothbrushes and, you know, started to find out what is just the warm enough sleeping bag to get by with. So it was kind of a journey that was relatively long and slightly expensive, right? I bought titanium spoons and 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 titanium pots and um, you know fancy wood stoves and that kind of things. Eventually, I ended up with doing a two week late autumn trip in Lapland with a fourteen kilo backpack, including all the food. Right, like everything I carried, you know, if I took off my clothes and put it on the backpack and hung it from a scale, it showed 14 kilos for a two week trip. And I was all the time warm, dry, and safe. I was well fed, you know, it was light to carry. And so, this whole journey, you know, it, it was kind of slow, right? Um, but it was a pleasure to have this light backpack, and I felt like, okay, this is a huge progress then i went to a trip uh like a survival course where we were one week uh also late autumn and we had one week and we had three kilos of allowed equipment and it was very defined so it was like you know uh, there was one knife for two or three people right so not everybody would have a knife uh there, it would be you know very minimal equipment no food just some salt and some glucose and and um you know very very basic and certainly no pleasure this whole trip was really tough and 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 i lost 
four or five kilos in this week and had a lot of nights that I was cold, I was hungry, my body didn't work, I got headaches, you know, it was not a pleasure. But from these three kilos, I started to say, okay, I can now try to go from the 14 kilos that I have, I can try to go even lighter, or I can go the three kilos and make them a little bit heavier and see where does it start to be comfortable again. So I took these three kilos and thought, okay, if I add a rain poncho, right, I will have a lot more comfort. I will have a shelter that works for night and for day, just with a 500 gram poncho. And I think the same approach for sustainability is very, very feasible to to dare this adventure and go to this edge of the three kilos and see how much you have to add to go back to levels that you are kind of happy with. Because when we look at the size of our lifestyles and the speed of our lifestyles, like we are currently, like the Finnish overshoot day this year was in 31st, I think of March, right? Which means that like, should I explain overshoot day? Sure. Okay. So overshoot day is something that if everybody would live the way you do, right? Or like, let's say in the terms of the Finnish national overshoot day, if everybody would live like we do here in Finland, our regrowing natural resources would be used at the 31st of March, right? So that means that the Finnish lifestyle, the average Finnish lifestyle or the sum of Finnish lifestyles is like four times bigger than it can be to be sustainable on this planet, right? So, um, and when I look at everything that we do, right, that has footprints, like we are, we are here, high up, right? We need to be here. So we have a huge way where we can go down without even losing any survivability, right? Like all these kind of stuff that we have grown used to that we would maybe consider as habits or even we might call them needs, right? We have also created needs, right? Um, we might actually have a need for a car. We might have a need for money. We might have a need uh, for electricity because they are tools to take care of our six survival priorities nowadays. At the same time, like it, it gives me, a, you know, it really relaxes me to see, okay, we are that high, so we have a lot of leeway, right? So I, I thought with the 14 kilo backpack, you know, I was already here, but then I thought, okay, I can be even at the three kilo level, maybe four or five kilo level. So this approach of, of making existing lifestyles more sustainable versus trying to go all in and going as sustainable as possible and then see how much we need to go kind of back to actually kind of have it acceptable for our own needs or desires. I think that approach, I find it a lot more promising. It's a lot faster, right? We, we need fast and we benefit from it. Like I'm, I'm sick of calling, talking about the need to change. You know, it's like the possibilities of change are, you know, almost outrageous. Like it's, it's unbelievable how many how good possibilities we have. Everything we need for change is there. Like all the tools, everything there, mostly copy paste solutions that already exist elsewhere. We just need to look for them and implement them. So the possibilities are unbelievable, and the benefits. This is what really you know is the selling point for me. Is the benefits of a like high level sustainable lifestyle is not just that. It, there's a possibility for us to survive in there, but it also means that life is easier, easier to understand, uh, easier to accomplish, right? You have more free time, you you have more connection, you're more resilient, um, usually it means you're healthier, right? Um, and like all these, and, and less pollution, less impact, right? All these benefits, they're for me like a lot bigger reason to go this journey and dare this adventure uh, than the necessity of change. How do you... What's the word? How do you reconcile that with the current process of constantly accelerating development and and uh, increased like omnipresence of complex technology 
and the machine that's creating that. Because I understand, like it's easier to to see how for individual people the transition uh, towards the kind of or the kind of way of living in the world that you're uh, talking about is a lot easier than people understand. But then when you think about on a systemic level and think about the things that cause the machine to be up and running and accelerating and and also like transforming society at an accelerating rate and transforming also the everyday reality of many people for example i imagine people who grow up with tiktok and you know whose attention spans are destroyed at least partly due, due to that exposure Can you use another word and reconcile? I don't know the word. Put it in perspective, or yeah, like um, if it's true that it's easier than people generally think to sort of, if you want to use this word, downshift and have increased life quality. But if it's also simultaneously true that we do have a global machine that's accelerating, that's uh, constantly developing more and more uh, mesmerizing technology that sort of like swallows people in and, and affects how people perceive reality and also what people find relevant in reality, uh, how does the change, the ease of change for particular individuals who are up for it, uh, transfer to to the reality of the machine? Mm. I'm I'm not so sure if. In the change making process that the how is the most relevant question um you know it's like when, when i when i look at our situation it can be compared to you know just just barely having it made it to a lifeboat from a sinking ship or or, or like you know when you're on a lifeboat it's like you cannot push people to come on board right that are floating in the water um it's it's something that needs to be understood needs to be seen in the narratives that we have right it needs to be understood that this is this is a lifeboat Right. If this picture is not even seen, then um, then it's quite hard to to convince people to also come on board. Um, like what kind of gives me hope is that sooner or later we will be at bicycle speed and bicycle distances in our lifestyles mostly, and that is either happening sooner and out of choice. Or it's happening later and out of lack of choice, but it will happen. And like once people have the feeling that they are missing out, that that you know, like right, I could I could I could um push people and say, hey, don't do this, or this is bad, right? Or or shame on you, you're like, you know, driving a Porsche or I don't know, like, or you're you're spending your whole day PlayStation or what is it these days or TikTok or whatever. Um, like how how is that supposed to help our situation? Um versus like people maybe see me being very happy and wonder like why is this guy so happy i want some of that so um 
this this pushing versus pulling is a little bit tricky because pushing is usually faster and easier to you know easier to identify where to push or who to push whereas pulling you need to start with yourself and and pulling is usually slower um and at the same time it's the more sustainable approach uh, because it's you know inviting at best so um and when I think of how to, you know, I don't know how to feel about this, right? That that I can see that something else is a lot more beneficial and doable and necessary um, compared to like what so many of us are still doing, how we are spending our time, energy, money, and resources on. Um, I, I, I tend not to look at it too much, um, because it would probably like slow me down or, or pull me down. Um, and also I think that it's not necessarily like the complete enough image of our society. Like, you know, if, if you look at the evening news, most of the stuff is bad news, right? Otherwise it wouldn't make it into the news. We are interested in bad news because it, you know, kind of... It's probably evolutionary, it helped us survive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, you know, gives us a, a feeling what dangers to look out for, right? We are fascinated by the stories of the evil. Um, and when I, at the same time, look right and left of the news, like, so, so when you look at the news, you can have the impression that it's really bad, our situation. When you look right and left and look how fast the eco-village network is growing, how fast the transition movement is growing, how, I don't know, how, how, how much narratives of, of change, like, I mean, we have the ESGs, like that's, that's a big thing nowadays, right? It's like the, uh, the sustainability development goals, um, uh, or SDGs, like, like these are things that are now present at the high level of company development of governmental talks, of, you know, they're present at the United Nations, um, which, you know, does give me a lot of hope. It just doesn't show in the news. So when I when I look at the people who spend their lives on on TikTok and I don't know what, um, like they they will come also at some point. You know, it's uh, nothing. I want to waste too much energy thinking about. Um, and also I find it difficult to, I used to think like, what can I do to, for example, change those people, right? Um, like it started when I became vegetarian with 16. It's like, okay, what can I do to make my father eat less meat? And I played like nice tricks on him. <laughs> like I would, you know, my mother, she would always make him the morning sandwich and she would put this bacon, whatever there. And I would sometimes replace these meaty ones with some vegetarian looks like bacon things and i would ask him like after so how was your breakfast yeah it was quite good but i noticed immediately it was like fake right it was like it was not the real thing like you know and and i tried a couple of different ones you know and and thought like maybe there is one where he would not notice but he would always notice and one day i asked him so how was your breakfast this one he's like yeah it was pretty good but like you know it was not the real thing but it was the real thing like i didn't change it you know <laughs> so um <laughs> And what, what did I think about this? Oh, yeah. So, so when I when I was younger, I tried to, you know, for example, push my father into not eating meat. I was like wondering, what can I do? And I now feel like, okay, it's not my responsibility to change others. Um, I can I can change my own life much easier, right? It's much easier to change my own life than changing other people's lives. Uh, I can do it immediately. I don't need to ask permission. I don't need to put anyone in an awkward position, you know, or don't need to make anyone feel blamed or shamed. Um, and 
And I think that that has a much bigger impact in the long term than um, you know me trying to change others. So I think what you said, like how do I put this in perspectives, right? What I feel we should do or what is possible uh, and beneficial compared to what so many are still doing or start doing or continue doing. Um, like, it's not really my job. Of course, it is my concern because others' behaviors impact the survivability of myself and, you know, impact the future of, of um, I don't know, or the presence even of my own child. And so, yeah, sure, there's, I, I, I'm concerned by what others are doing. At the same time, it's not something that, I feel that the, my energy is better spent by trying to understand how can I improve my own life and, and ideally like build communities along the way. Mm. You know. Yeah, I pretty much share that way of relating to change that I would wish to see in the world. Uh, and as years have passed, uh, more and more found myself there that, that that I really don't feel I need or want to push other people into directions they don't want to go but I'm uh, up for inviting people on journeys with me that that uh, might be transformative and in, in when you do that you also make yourself vulnerable in in, in many like uh, positive ways that that you're not just like, from somewhere above guiding others but you're actually with them in the mm. process and uh, i really appreciate your emphasis on on the why instead of the how because i think focusing on the how tends to lead to totalitarianism because uh, the tendency to em emphasize how tends to have as a starting point a uh, hubristic assumption that you know how things should be done on a wider scale and mm. you generally then think that your solutions are and should be scalable everywhere and should be applicable everywhere and it doesn't take into account like context it doesn't take into mm. account locality differences mm. privilege people yeah mm. all that sort of stuff so i really really appreciate uh, appreciate that and uh I do think that the systemic problems that I've been referring to are more challenging uh, or, or I don't find that I have had like uh, satisfying answers from you related to questions related to them but I'm not also not sure if satisfying answers are available because I'm not sure there are questions that or, or that there are problems that can be solved with anything that can be like articulated in, in in like uh, in sentences that fit into the very loose constraints of our podcast uh, I, I also want to say that I I know that miracles happen and when I say miracle I refer to an event or a process that doesn't fit into my current worldview or my current understanding of the world but that haven't happen regardless and mm -hmm. then transform my worldview uh to possibly exchange expand or change it in a way that afterwards makes the change that happened possible or, mm -hmm. or like that fits into that sort of worldview and i think the fact that we don't see the solutions clearly doesn't mean that they're not possible but also this also includes uh, even though i find your framing of the sort of predicament where we find ourselves in, in, in as a civilization regarding the problems of sustainability i find find them very convincing but simultaneously i'm not sure that just because I found them convincing. They're actually uh, uh, a clear enough picture of our reality. And in relation to this, and also to contextualize your, um, I, I want to understand how certain you are 
uh, regarding the basic premises you start from. So just uh, I'm going to throw you a couple of questions and you can answer intuitively. You don't have to have any like uh, very precise answer or, or argument to support that. But just to understand uh, your, your thinking and your relationship to, to how certain you are, do you think that in a hundred years from now, or what probabil probability percentage would you give uh, to there being a high-tech civilization one one hundred years from now? What percentage? Uh -huh. Just an intuitive answer. Sixty. So there would be a high-tech civilization. Uh, well, um, what is the size of the civilization? I believe that there will be bubbles. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that within i don't know how long i'm going to live obviously um i wouldn't be surprised that in my expectable lifetime that there would still be a quite a big uh, decrease in size of human population um mainly owed to us having um international fast transport of goods and people or goods and species um, with airplanes so what we saw in the pandemic uh, like the COVID pandemic like we have a quite fast spread um, and we are still having this perfect environment for viruses to spread globally um, and viruses adopt over time and the, the race of us developing um, antidotes let's say uh, compared to the speed of adaptability of new viruses. Um, it's a very tight race nowadays. Um, so, yeah, I, I believe that there will be kind of high-tech bubbles. Uh, Low-tech will be, as a, as a, in terms of importance, low-tech will be the dominating one. Okay, same question, but 1,000 years from now. Just a hunch or instinct. Irrelevant. But I'm, I'm interested. Real. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's not relevant. Like, um, because, like, even thinking 100 years, like, I, I like to, you know, there's this indigenous way to, to say that, like uh, think with seven generations ahead of you in mind um like that's that's almost a luxury nowadays to to be able to think that far it's uh, things have become too complex to to evaluate your own impact on future generations um of, of course you can have the goodwill right you can have like one generations in a thousand years to come you know as a motivator um, the well-being of them, including human generations. So, <clears throat> I cannot answer that. So, even I understand that you feel it to be irrelevant, but you don't have any sort of hunch that you could just like. I would, trip. I would, as a hunch, I would say in a thousand years there's no more humans. Hmm. That would be my hunch. I was going to ask because I will contextualize or, or explain why I ask these questions in a bit, but I was going to ask the same question with the time frame of a million years, but uh, if you don't believe there will be humans anymore. There might be humans again. Well, not in a million years. It takes too much time to develop into a human shape. Um, but, um, but of course, evolution is so not linear. That yeah, uh, it's, and, and, and then again, there might be, you know, space is big. I have no idea. It's like beyond my horizon. Mm. My like one of my reasons for asking about this is that I'm interested in whether you think that a high tech civilization is in principle impossible. Uh, like that, that the word high tech, and of course we haven't defined high tech, but but I understand you by low tech. You mean basically technologies that are where the whole manufacturing and design pro process can be understood by for example one person yeah like easy to implement technologies um like 
you wouldn't actually it wouldn't even need to be that 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 only one person that already one person can understand it right you can have like um you know like a low tech energy harvesting to to power a whole house which might still be complex piping right um and and complex wiring like and and the technology behind it kind of the let's say the the bridge between solar or 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 wind energy being present in the environment to to you having light burning on the ceiling you know this this bridge that that kind of that takes the energy and turns it into another form of energy that uh is low tech for me low tech is like um that it can be made like uh, people also say it's like appropriate technology it's also called appropriate technology so that um you know it's it can be based on on recyclable materials uh, or or commonly available natural materials that are regrowing um that detours are avoided wherever possible like as an example you can right you can you can have a, a solar panel uh, and a battery bank and that can power your blender in the kitchen right you can make your smoothie with the electricity you can also just take a, a bicycle and strap a blender to it right like the you know you can have the muscle power you have you know you have something mechanically moving and you move it mechanically without the detour of electricity where you have always losses in the energy transition or transformation right you have losses heat losses transformation losses you're losing something on the way from from a to b well if you you know grow the food eat it and power your blender by muscle power you're avoiding all these detours and and you have like um a lower lower tech way to harvest the energy mainly uh, namely the plants in your garden right that harvest the energy for you so that's a low tech example um do you think a bicycle is low tech nowadays yes there was a time where a bicycle was a high tech device um you're right the, the the time of the first bicycles that was the technical frontier so um <clears throat> bicycle is very low tech because i'm thinking of the manufacturing of the tires yeah of, of like of course it's always in relation right to to um what is the current high tech um like for me low tech is also a way of thinking right to to look at okay we can mm, well well some, somebody who is like um I might might be upset now that I use wording like this so we can we can think of what is how how to produce more sustainable spoons right um we already have more spoons than people in the world so we can just carry a spoon right this is a very uh in a way low tech approach right that the spoon is already there just take it with you no need to invent more sustainable manufacturing processes and materials to to create spoons that have lower footprints right so even though the metal spoon i carry might have used more resources in the making than some some sustainable spoon we might develop these days it's still already an existing spoon so kind of the uh, i'm not sure if low tech is the right word but to to call it that when i just carry my own spoon all the time but mm. I like the the to use the word appropriate for this technology. So, um, as an example, you could have solar cells that photovoltaic that make electricity and charges batteries, and then you can um, power tools whenever you want. You can also say, okay, let's skip the batteries and use the solar power, use the tools only when the sun is shining right to to skip this one element in between and then just adjust the life around it that okay those tools can only be used in daytime and then i maybe keep one battery to have some light at night 
but not use the, I don't know, certain machinery that uses more electricity in the night. Mm. Like there, there's something that you know, there's not so many examples in in our, I don't know, is it called Western Northern Hemisphere, whatever modern. Like usually the the societies that have higher impacts, higher footprints, bigger footprints. Like we don't see so many low tech examples anymore, right? We we if you see a sewing machine somewhere, I'm most of the time it will be electricity powered, right? Instead of treadle powered, which a lot of this like there have been unbelievable amount of treadle powered or foot muscle powered machinery before the Second World War in the 1920s, 30s. Those were still around. Um, a lot of these machines have been um, recycled into guns in the Second World War. So a lot of this stuff has disappeared. So in our society, we don't see so many examples anymore. We might see some treadle-powered sewing machine because they were very common. We might see them in the antique shop somewhere. But a lot of like treadle-powered band saws and, and lathes and drills and all these things we don't see anymore, right? So what, um, what I find interesting when I look at Finland look at our average life expectancy, how old we get, and look at our, uh, let's say, the national overshoot day, right? So we have quite a high life expectancy, much higher than the global average, which is somewhere around 73 years. We are somewhere, I don't know, in 70s for the male and over 80 for the women. So one of the reasons for us to have this high life expectancy is a health system with a lot of high tech right we can we can keep people well and alive a lot longer with a lot of high tech medical equipment when we now look at um like for example, the Solomon Islands I looked up the other day, they actually have, they are in the moment on the global average on 73 years. So the Solomon Islands life expectancy, average life expectancy for both gender is about 73 years. Same as Russia, by the way. Um, so when you look at the national overshoot day of Solomon Islands, it is in November. So what what we did like the the high tech that allows us to have a relatively high life expectancy we paid for by selling our forests in finland right we turned our biodiversity into money to to you know buy a good health system good uh, school system also which you know altogether gives us a higher life expectancy we have better work safety than in solomon islands uh, we have all kinds of like, you know, better infrastructure, safer, you know, we have rules on how many people can sit in a car and that you need to have seatbelts and airbags and whatnot. So all this is kind of high tech solutions. And we traded them for biodiversity without wanting so, right? So now to have productive forests, we need monocultures. So when I now look at 73 years, right? 73 years is not bad. Right, like just in the 1960s, 70s, Finnish average life expectancy was lower than 73 years. Yeah, so back then, if you died 73 years, you would not think that like, oh wow, I died early, right? Nowadays, if somebody dies at 73 years or 65 years, you're like, wow, that was a bit young, right? So it's always, you know, in relation of what we are used to. So when I look at 73 years, it's not bad. So I'm looking at Solomon Islands and look, okay, how do they manage to have National Overshoot Day November and a pretty good national, uh, pretty good average life expectancy? Because I would I would count 73 years as pretty good, right? So, and they do not have the high tech, right? They have low tech also in terms of um, not needing this high tech equipment. Um, that keep, you know, like my father is uh, in, in the care home with Alzheimer. And even 
with just Alzheimer, he has already high tech machinery taking care of him, like monitoring stuff. So in societies that have less technology around, also entertaining technology, people are more connected with each other. When there is no light, people talk more, right? If they're all people share stories. So that means the, the wisdom, the stories of the old people are still being asked, right? The older people have more of a function. Alzheimer is less likely to set in because they get new knowledge. They sleep more because there is more darkness, right? If we have lights on all the time and screens we, and, and a faster lifestyle, we also sleep less. So all this is having impact on how much Alzheimer you find in a society. So, and this is all like kind of examples of low tech, right? Often low tech example is absence of high tech, nothing else. Or it means that um, people still know what plants to take from the garden to stay healthy, right? Nowadays we need a pharmacy and, and high tech machinery to make medication for us. So I, I think that our society, in, instead of striving to develop more and more high tech and trying to like, you know, for example, with, with nuclear, which is a high technology, nuclear energy, we are looking at, okay, we have some problems that we have not solved, but we trust that our technological development will solve them in the future. Well, if you look at high, uh, at low tech, you don't, you already have the questions all answered, right? Um, and I, I find it a lot more appealing to look in this direction. Um, was it even Tere who said hikitalisatio? Like not civilization, but sweatilization, right? To go back to muscle power. Paulina Kainulainen wrote a nice book, Hyvä työ, hikityö, tai, or something like this. Um, and, and I think we are like somehow, is it avert? Like we, we try to avoid using energy. And then we more easily look into machines doing the work for us than, than we doing the work ourselves. It's, it's a, it's a you know, natural thing to be lazy, right? It's like, because it means we conserve energy. So, and, and I think that we have gone over a certain limit where we just need to accept and need to understand also that it's good for us to actually, you know, do a bit more physical work ourselves and, and to um, also um, see the benefits of the social technologies, like, you know, sharing networks, and which is all very low tech, right? Um, to, to share meals with each other, to share a kitchen together, share a washing machine together. It's all very low tech solutions. Um, or, or low-tech approaches. And I think there's a lot more for us to gain when looking in this direction versus when we look in the high-tech direction. Yeah. Hmm. This is related to my previous question regarding high-tech civilization. Um, I w want to describe a thought that I have. This is not like a, a value statement. It's just like the, a thought that I observe myself having. Or, or this is not a statement on where we should aim as a civilization. But uh, I find the tendency, referring to our previous conversation uh, uh, regarding the role of exploration, in in being a human i find the tendency of humans for example to look for new continents or or, or spread out over the planet to be continuous with our both our uh, attributes as human humans this particular species and also as our attributes uh, as animals because other animals also spread and uh, f trying to find new habitats especially when uh, some catastrophe pushes them away from their old ones and i see continuous with the same thing the human drive for example to 
go to Mars or go to the moon, which we uh, have done a bit, and also the dream of humanity as an interstellar civilization, I find that also to be an expression of the same drive. That to me, it seems natural for people to want that. When a, if, when a habitat is getting destructed. But but also, not just then, but also just like, I think it's natural for people, mm. even if we had uh, a sustainable life here, I think the exploratory part of being human would also, it's part of its curiosity would be driven towards that direction. Mm. Uh, do you agree that this is like uh, just a, a drive that we have? I, I, I think so. Like um, there, there have been reports in Scotland you know, like long, long, long time ago, um, that people have arrived on the coast with a kayak, like a f it was a funny looking boat, you know, they had not seen a kayak before. And, and they spoke a strange language. It turned out those were Inuit from Greenland who came to Scotland by kayak, you know, which is an incredible feat in itself by, you know, kayak made of natural materials, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and and I think that you know when I when I put myself in the position of of these Inuit who who took on this journey, you know they could not have done so if they had not had the kayak, right? So I think it's quite natural that when we when we can develop spacecraft, that we also look where can we go with them. Um, and I, I yeah I think it's 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 something you know. I would say it's the least I expect from us to explore. Um, at the same time, it's again, you know, the why question that is defining on how do we use the technology, right? Do we, do we, uh, right? Can we justify? Can we afford space tourism, or do we need to reserve this these resources, energy, and and the money and the time of engineering and whatever? Um, you know, do we need to reserve it for for scientific stuff only? Can we afford it to use it for military the technology, right? So, um, sure. Um, regarding the question, why well, it was not a question you asked, like it, you just mentioned Mars. Um, like human life is only right. For for example, in in here in the subarctic, human life would not be possible without the mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know what amount of species and habitats we would need to transport to Mars to actually have a longer ability to survive there. Right? We can we can build bubbles and we can grow some food in some greenhouses and harvest energy there. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, like it's a question. I I, I don't think we understand how much biodiversity we actually need to survive mm -hmm. yeah i tend to agree on that and yeah i particularly did not want to ask yet about the viability because i was just interested in in the part of whether you think it's a natural drive for us and uh yeah re regarding the necessity necessities of long-term space travel or, or colonization Ilya Lehtinen wrote a very interesting piece regarding this in his critique of Pontus Purokurus book uh, regarding the Tausin automatisoitu luxus avaruus homo communismi thing, where he was criticizing the idea that we even be, on principle can survive longer times and multi-generationally uh, outside the confines of our planet. But um, if we just focus on the sustainable like re resource resource sustainability uh question do you think that it was never possible for us to become and and once again like just as a hunch because uh, i i don't i know that this is not your like uh, main focus of interest, but do you think it was never possible for us to become an inter interstellar stellar species, or, or or any species? Maybe we become? already are in a weird dimension. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, this is going metaphysics uh, direction. I'm 
Yeah, but if if I constrain the question to 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 talk about just the technology approach to to you know traveling to other planets or even yeah, solar I, systems. Yeah, I, I mean, yes, we can do that. I mean, like, um, I, I still see that we need a home base like our planet for doing that because a spacecraft would need to be quite big to to carry all, all everything we need to to you know like even to repair the spacecraft right um so i think without a, a home base um which maybe doesn't need to be Earth, it can maybe be another planet. I think without the home base, it cannot work. But you, so you're, you don't think, or I'm thinking of how to phrase this, you think it's it might be possible that if a civilization did fi- find a sustainable way of living on its like origin ecosystem, origin planet, planet of origin, that you don't think it's in principle impossible to have the sort of high tech, high tech that would be necessary uh, to spread out from this planet and to do it in a sustainable way. Mm. Like, I mean, there, there, there is this. If we do continue to live on another planet, or if we um, make space journeys and use other planets as resource storage, whatever, um, this is really going science fiction now. Yeah, <laughs> um, definitely. Like, we would not be able to do so sustainably if we. You know, just keep on doing things like we're doing here, or right? mm-hmm. um, like we would just, you know, outsource the problem or or just take it with us. Um, like, I mean, this is almost a question like kind of what do we do and if we can do, um, is it even possible to to leave our planet behind, right? So if we f- find out that it's becoming more and more uh, or less and less inhabitable, this planet for us, you know, that human life is not possible here anymore, for sure it's like you know our approach to flee and and search for for new terrains um and apparently we put a lot of effort in trying to find new places uh without much success so far mm. and again like there are so many questions unanswered and even unheard of like there are a lot of questions we don't know yet uh, which are connected to to the idea of going high tech on this planet or another planet compared to um, the very, very few, if at all, any unanswered questions when it comes to, to slower, low tech lifestyles. Uh, of course, there are a lot of questions in terms of transitioning from where we are now to, to, to a lifestyle with more low tech and more connection, more community. Um, because we are, of course, in a bit of a situation, right? That, uh, as you said, like we don't feel the need for community, right? We might not have the idea that community is a survival priority. Um, or that we don't need people to live right next to us, together with us, uh, over a distance that's directly perceivable for us in order to survive because we can cover 
our survival needs by leaning on the machine that's a sort of hiding the actualities of mm. where, how and from where those survival needs are being yeah. covered. Yeah, of course. There, you know, it doesn't take much thinking to to figure that one out, mm -hmm. right? That that there actually are dependencies, and that it's uh, and responsibilities, right? That others are dependent on our actions. Um, Like you, you would very soon feel that you have a community issue if the ambulance doesn't arrive when you need one, right? So, um, or if nobody, you know, lets you out of the supermarket with your purchase, right? Hmm. Mm. Hmm. I don't know what else to say now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I found it interesting to to probe with those questions because uh because I'm interested in like your thinking regarding how much of the problems with high tech come from high-tech itself and how much they come from something something deeper that's like in principle making some things possible and not others but uh i, I think with high-tech there's a lot of questions like that we ask like what is actually possible and with low-tech we know what is possible right mm -hmm. it's it's there's less questions mm -hmm. um so that's why i'm also like not too tempted to think in the high tech direction. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there is some relevance. Like, I don't know. Um, when I when I look at Formula One races, right? There, there's uh, the argument that we need Formula One races because those cars with the competition, there's a lot of high tech developed in this competitive competitive pressure, right? Um, which I argue that if we would feel the pressure that we are under, we would also be able to develop those technologies without having those races. Um, but of course, it it um, you know now now existing transportation modes like benefit from the outcomes of the Formula One races in terms of more efficient engines, lighter constructions, and so on. Um, not necessarily more sustainable ones, um, but often they are. So um, some of this high tech allows us, right, to to right. We have, for example, like fifty years ago, you would see very very few windmills. You know, some some geeks would build their own, but you would not see much of these big industrial ones. You might see some scientific research models, but they will not be as widespread as now. Um, and then we have grown into societies where we have centralized power generations in terms of coal, whatever power power plants, and then we have the distribution networks. So now the the high tech development in wind turbine design is beneficial because we can link it directly to this grid, right? And and we can cover our let's say electricity wants, I wouldn't want to call them needs, we can cover them more easily with the high tech that we have developed on those really big wind turbines. And that's like high tech in terms of, you know, material strength and and design features, efficiency, um, ways to use gases to cool down certain or insulate heat, insulate certain uh, electricity components of the windmill so it's like a lot of high tech there um which one could could argue like yeah that makes that allows us to have those windmills in the first place the high tech at the same time if we have like you know instead of having one huge windmill have like five thousand small ones built of old bicycle parts or i don't know how many thousands that would be but they are a lot easier to build because there's a lot more already existing materials available. We don't need to um, get new fossil materials to build new windmills, 
um, right? and they could easily be installed everywhere. You don't need a special location for those compared to the big windmills that you know you can't just put in the middle of the city. So uh, I, I do see both. Like I do see that there is a high tech is allowing us certain certain developments in terms of harvesting renewable energy, for example. But low tech can kind of do the same. It's just not in our DNA maybe to think so small. I don't know. Or in our narratives of current times where we expect that you know energy is provided to us and that, that, that we are not making it or harvesting it ourselves. Yeah, it's interesting to to try to imagine how fruitful it might be if we invested more of our focus and our resources to both thinking about and and practically like using and tinkering with i would say uh, i'll use the word lower tech here because because yeah we have a fascination to always be using the most up-to-date te technology and i i started thinking about i don't know if you know villa matthias heikkilä uh, he, uh, I don't know if he coined the term, but he, he uses the term perma computing, and uh, he's really into retro computers, and he's really interested in how much you can squeeze out of, you know, a VIC twenty from mm -hmm. from the end nice of the seventies or or beginning of the eighties. I can't recall, yeah. maybe eighty one or something. So he's like uh, into coding stuff, like demos for those old computers, and he's also like interested in whether. Uh, I've, I've talked with him about, for example, like could something like Facebook be run actually on a, on an ATS machine if mm. you just like uh, reduce the complexity and reduce mm. the uh, the requirements of what mm. you want to have from from that sort of technology. And I think there's a lot of areas of technology. Of course, a computer is still already quite high tech, but still like that just the the general approach of trying to think about how to to utilize better what we already yeah. have is like just i think there's shitloads of uh low hanging fruit that people oh, yeah. are just oh, yeah, not yeah. looking at yet and yeah, uh, yeah i have a question uh, conversation with Ville Matias in my other podcast for for those who speak finnish and are interested but yeah he's a really interesting thinking thinker in in that sense i, I was uh, actually um interested to 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 ponder this direction like a couple of years ago um i had customers who are working for ubisoft like a big mm -hmm. game yeah. software developer and they were working on the game avatar so quite a big game with all kinds of features and and they got a free day or extra day of holiday if they can could prove that they spend it in nature because it's a game like this avatar nature connection in the avatar people plays a role there. And um, so they spent the day with me, but what they told me was that the game is, is almost ready at that time, but they cannot release it yet because the hardware for the end user doesn't exist yet, right? So, um, and of course in, in their company with their big I don't know, not supercomputers, but big computers, huge calculation power. Like they could run the game, but not at the end user yet. So, and when yeah. I when I now think about like uh, 80s or 90s, like I don't know what what kind of computer games there were. Like I remember the very earliest interactive game was like some kind of tennis Pong. on a on a television, right? Where you yeah, move. It's called this. Pong. Pong. Like, how entertaining was that? It was like as entertaining as as a as a you know game could be at that time, right? Like we would be hanging with the kids, watching the adults play it, and and we would like you know were allowed to play it ourselves. It was like extremely entertaining. Also, this you know snake game on the phone, like on these Nokia phones, like you know really 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 simple in terms of you know hardware demand. And nowadays, like when I when I look at the stuff my child is playing, like, you know, it's like almost real, like in terms of, you know, like graphic definition and, and, 
and the sounds are unbelievable the speed of the game the complexity the many levels the interaction with other players and again it's as entertaining as it could be right it's like you know it's not that we get more entertained by faster games right or more complex games or more complex games i'm not sure about that but yeah let's entertain the i mean act. like in in or, or you know it's it's as as intriguing right you you really you know are eager to play it like it's not you know you wouldn't like now if you look at snake you would say oh the lame game you know or this pong it's like okay w what's happening next you know people want something more and more and more so and and back then this was totally enough and and apparently like this this hardware race hardware software race that you know hardware needs faster software and then there's faster software and then like i have this ipad that i cannot use anymore because uh it's not you know not supported anymore the you know what, what like i have this bird app you know like colin's bird guide uh, highly recommended good bird guide and i had it on this old ipad and now i can't use it anymore because the ipad software is not supported anymore it's like otherwise a perfectly good machine you know nothing has happened with it and and i'm i'm thinking that like yeah there's probably like and now i hear that there is this niche and or maybe not a niche but there is this ambition by some to 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 look at also what is the sufficiency in computing yeah very nice mm. I want to circle back a bit, or actually not just a bit, but qu quite a portion of our, our conversation thus far, because we were talking before about the question of why is living in overshoot as a civilization, at least in some sense, possible. And and I think we've also like alluded to this many times throughout this conversation, but I think the basic problem is that we have a lack of clear feedback loops in the sense that of course like where our food comes from for example or our technology comes from is full of different kinds of feedback loops but they don't loop back to us in the sense that we don't get to feel or understand firsthand the effects that the production has and, and that's a big challenge that it's just in in many cases it's not even possible even if we wanted to to understand the chain of production that brought a particular food stuff or a particular machine to us and and this like probably plays quite a big role and and also also that the overshoot is possible because the effects of the overshoot emerge over a longer period of time and it, it's easier for us uh to react to an acute catastrophe where you see the effects is having instantaneously but but when the catastrophe is spread over a longer period of time and and deal with delay uh -huh, yeah. yeah precisely that uh, that even if we stopped now still there's effects mm. and with a lot of momentum so i think that's part of the, the thing uh, that makes living in overshoot possible in a sense yeah and 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 if we wouldn't like you know the, the lifestyle that has an early overshoot day is usually extremely tempting lifestyle like it's when you when you look at the countries with very high overshoot days which in, includes finland or very early overshoot days um it, it usually means that people have a relatively high life standard in 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 terms of i don't know let's say in bubble terms because for me it would, for me having an early overshoot day is a very low life standard right it's not a high life standard it's very low it's like it, it's suicide right that's not living it's not even a life standard it's a suicide standard to have an overshoot day um and like that we do not see the effects i think is is partly also because we do spend more time inside than outside 
like for example like if you spend life indoors mostly like your confrontation with climate change will be some data that is presented to you by some scientists on the news whereas if you spend more time outside your contact with climate change is what you can see year to year how things are changing same with biodiversity loss right you you, you, there's no need to see the numbers to feel human impact on our planet. It's it's very very visible, um, and there's this nature connection mentor called John Young. He's saying that the medicine our world needs the most is deep nature connection, uh, which I totally agree and and there's no question about this in my eyes that he's right about that like um if we fix nature connection we solve climate change on the side like you know climate change is basically a symptom of 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 nature deficit disorder or 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 lack of nature connection which could also be called dissociation yeah yeah um so You know how 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 can you see a symptom of your lifestyle if your lifestyle is already a symptom, right? It's um, and then and then like perceived as easy living. Yeah, like I don't think it's easy living to work two hours a day to pay for shelter. You know, it's not very easy. Like a natural shelter made from natural materials, like it takes five to ten minutes a day to keep it in shape, and you're warm, dry, and safe. It's, uh, yeah. Can you ask your question again? Like, I, I have the feeling that I drifted off and didn't mm. answer. That well, it was just regarding the what makes overshoot, living in overshoot possible, and and uh, the role of the lack of feedback loops in there. I, I think yeah. that was the last. Uh, yeah, I I think I think we are we are not lacking feedback loops. Like or or we're not, you know, like like a lot of these feedback loops or or a sufficient amount of feedback loops is easily visible. Yeah, but what I mean is the practicality of experiencing those feedback loops. So, for example, um, I've been thinking about forests in Helsinki and forest protection, uh, and uh, a big part of this is inspired by my wife who's uh, been for years very active in forest protection but i've been thinking about what are the causes that lead people who make decisions not to have the protection of forests as a high priority mm -hmm. and and one thing is probably that they do not spend time in the forests mm -hmm. that they are making decisions uh or when they're making decisions that impact forests, they not necessarily have spent a long time in the forest or a lot of time in the forest. And if they did spend more time in the forest, they probably would be impacted, uh, like in, in how they mm. prioritize things. And I, I cannot say how much, because not everyone who spends a lot of, lot of time in a forest ends up with the same conclusions. But I, I think it's still an effect. And in there, for example, the feedback loop is missing in the sense that when they make the political de decision, for example, to bulldoze a forest, mm. they don't uh, they don't live through the effects of that decision. Yeah, often. and they probably do exactly what they are meant to do, right? Like if if um, I don't know, your your job is to make sure that everybody has an apartment. Mm -hmm, sure. And it happens to be that nowadays people want to have 43 square meters per person, right? Because this is what we are used to and, and we want this. And and um, and uh, we have a lot of apartments where only one person is living in. Um, then then you're, you're fulfilling your task, your job as a politician to make sure that new apartments can be built. Mm -hmm. And you might not think that like, okay, now I have a problem because 
if I if I build these apartments, then we will you lose this area or this area or this area, like I'm I'm quite quite unsure if if we can expect fast enough change from politics like in my experience like governmental decision making is usually too slow um usually somehow corrupted either by the system right like it's corrupted by the idea that we want to have gdp growth it's corrupted by uh, maybe right some politician might be there for the wrong reasons, right? Because uh, they want to have more contracts for their cousin's company, or um, so I, I think that the political decision making is is not only too too slow for the needs of our times, but also it's it's inappropriate, right? It's even even the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, which politicians signed uh, is a very poor compromise in terms of what we really need. Uh, it's the best compromise we could get, but it's a compromise. And and it's um, like somehow somehow it it's nice to see that there is decisions being made in in terms of i don't know climate action on political levels um at the same time i find it much nicer to see that it's so much easier to do a lot more than what the paris climate agreement is demanding um like just by deciding for it mm. yeah i wouldn't wait for political decisions like it's it's too 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 many eggs in one basket and not necessary like not necessary to 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 wait for governments or to demand change through governments it's important that change happens there but it's um, not as important as the change that we can do in personal, but also organizational or company levels. Mm -hmm. Companies can, by the way, change really fast because legislation was usually made to facilitate that companies can adopt to the demands of the market. So, um, yeah, so I, th I think companies are an interesting level to just to bring change um, that spreads in both directions up and down mm, definitely and yeah when you went you mentioned the apartment point of view yeah, it's not like that wanting to build apartments for people is a bad thing it's just like an observation that probably when building more apartments means basically getting rid of biodiverse environments like forests, um, probably spending more time in those forests would affect the decisions and priorities. And uh, I, I find myself like it's interesting to observe because I'm now uh, from the beginning of September for the next five months i'm sort of like on this i've, I've called it the so-called one day work week because i'm focusing on spending time with our daughter as my my wife is uh, uh, has returned to to writing her doctoral thesis and i've got the opportunity to spend a lot of a lot more time in the forest uh, with my my daughter and uh, also like spending time on her level like just like on the height mm -hmm. Axel <laughs> axis so that I'm more ne nearer to the ground and also like just going slower because she is a lot slower than what I'm used to mm -hmm. and I've 
observed myself paying a lot more attention, for example, to mushrooms during this this fall than I have before. And just like I find it amazing to just be able to observe how it affects me to spend more time in a forest and to spend spend time in a forest in a slower fashion and uh yeah i don't know what it what exactly it is that it's doing to me but uh i'm enjoying it so so when you when you go to to the forest with your daughter do you go to the forest to do something there or do you go to the forest to just be there with her to be there and uh yeah yeah obviously like the priority is to to be there to be able to spend time there to be with her mm. in a, in a context that's uh enjoyable for her uh in in some ways that are in some ways lacking in our apartment because i noticed that our daughter uh really needs to get outside mm. mm-hmm. and uh One one interesting observation that I've had, because uh, we live in Yolas and there's not like very big forests there, but I've found out that the more I walk in the forest in an unlinear fashion, uh, the bigger I realize the forest is. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, if I just like walk in a linear fashion through a path through the forest, then it's quite quickly done. But mm. if I just like don't have any particular direction that I'm going, I'm mm. just wandering around with her. It's amazing how you immerse yourself in in the diversity mm. and ev- how even very small areas can mm. actually be just like yeah. I- infinite. That, that that's really really. Um, I, I totally second this impression. Like I, I used to uh, when I started to offer like these hiking trips to customers, like. You know, would choose routes that are like doable, like you know, not much more than fifteen kilometers per day, but surely more than eight. And nowadays, I do one or two kilometers a day, um, which I find a lot more rewarding for everyone involved. Um, it's a much deeper immersion, which you know, there's a parallel to traveling in general, like. I, I used to travel far, right? After after the army, I went to travel for one year and uh, had airplane tickets around the world and uh, really saw a lot of places, some of them actually quite deep, but it was mostly about, you know, I can maybe still squeeze in a day and see Persepolis and, uh, you know, like it was a bit of a quantity thing. And also like I, you know, counted how many countries I've already been to, and and nowadays I, you know, rather want to, you know, take the bicycle and go to a, a forest somewhere where I've not been five kilometers from me, right? Like, and and get to know that place, and it's yeah. Also, slower travel in general, like train or hitchhiking or ships, is like so much deeper way of traveling so much more memories and and interactions and mm. Mm. i want to talk with you about wilderness and uh work as a wilderness guide but i'm gonna take a toilet break at this point but uh if you'd like you can have the opportunity to do a, a monologue while i'm away and okay Okay. So I can already tell to the uh, listeners to to get a cup of water, because um, um, we can make a little nature nature connection exercise. So uh, maybe put the podcast on pause for a moment and get yourself a cup of water, and we continue in after you're back. So you're back now. 
um, and you have a cup of water or some water in your hands. So take a look at the water. I'm doing the same here with the water in the cup, water that came from the tap here in this building. And you can try to smell the water, experience the water. You can touch it with your finger, feel the moisture, feel how it feels on your skin. Mm. And maybe take a sip, maybe another one. And now take one more sip, but leave it in your mouth. So feel the water in your mouth, maybe close your eyes. If you don't have water, you can still jump in and just use your own spit. Move it around in your mouth and just feel it and just sense that the water that is in your mouth now, this water has been around the planet or on this planet for pretty much as long time as water can possibly be on this planet like the same molecules that have been in the clouds, underground, maybe for thousands of years underground. The same molecules have maybe been in the eyes of a dinosaur, in a pile of poop of someone, or in a glass of beer, and in the oceans. And it's the very same molecules. And there's actually quite a high probability that the water molecules that are now in your mouth have maybe even been in, I don't know, famous people of history that you might have heard of at some point in the life of those people. The very same molecules are now there in your mouth. And when you swallow them, they become part of your body and you carry them around for a couple of weeks until you pee or sweat them out or poop them out or puke them out or spit them out or shed a tear, very same molecules. And if you're now in a room with someone else and you just breathe in and breathe out, you have moisture from the air getting absorbed in your body. And when you breathe out, you exhale moisture that has been part of your body. And maybe the person next to you is going to breathe in the same air with the same water molecules and if if this was already an interesting experience i recommend going for a swim surround yourself with water maybe float on your back close your eyes try not to move at all just keep your breath keeping you afloat and feel the connection to the water around you how it enters your skin and becomes part of your body and how you're directly, or how we are directly connected through water. And Henry is back from the toilet. Eläköön mm-hmm. vesi. Wilderness. And working as a wilderness guide. Tell me how that came about. Hmm. A fellow student who was studying geography at the same university as I was, and I was also studying geography at that time, um, she put a newspaper article on the table in the commune and said, hey, Huck, look, there's a wilderness guide education program. Isn't that something that would interest you? By the way, put the mic a bit closer because there's okay. all this weird squeaking noise yeah, coming some in. people are moving tables and chairs <laughs> up there. Okay, so, yeah, so I saw this article and there was apparently some um, association in Germany that was offering some wilderness guide courses over a period of two years. Um, and I took these courses and that yeah, changed somehow my career plans. And now one of my professions is wilderness guide or um maybe it's not profession but um what is it called not occupation but like a 
calling vocation vocation yeah. vocation and and it's actually um really profession is not the word for it because at my workplace the concept of professions doesn't exist um and like i also find that the better the wilderness guides are the worse they are professionally in terms of marketing for example and also like professionally i would you know as a professional I would probably be happy about big groups right more money and as a wilderness guide i'm happy if i can go alone <laughs> but also happy to to take someone along and uh yeah make them feel good you said this effect that your uh, previous career path what was that going to be um well after high school and army and traveling i went to university s mostly because i could like i had the qualification to go to university and then i thought i need to use that qualification and need to go to university and study so at that time i did not really have a proper professional plan i was however already involved with greenpeace for so long that by now i would also be paid as a trainer for advanced climbing and boat driving like this you know inflatable boat driving and i would uh, do action logistics and so i had like kind of a career building up there and some kind of specific professional training there and that was about the same time when this wilderness guide courses started and then i ended university and went to work full time for Greenpeace Germany and Greenpeace International also partly and did the uh, wilderness guide courses on the side and then later once I moved to Finland I did this whole year of Finnish wilderness guide education on top of my already existing qualifications mm. Mm. yeah I don't think I had a proper career plan I just wanted to study and learn um and travel and uh, go climbing Did a lot of climbing back then and so my life was basically climbing and greenpeace actions and hanging out with my study mates at university so my student life had a focus on life not on study i changed a lot of subjects because it interested me to um yeah to to learn a lot um what I studied for the com whole time that I was at university was ethnology uh, with a focus of pre-Columbian Americas. And then I studied philosophy, Germanistics, geography, um, comparative religious science, and something called Volkskunde, which is a bit like ethnology, but had a focus on uh, Germany so cultural studies or yeah um did i study something else no that was i think these were all the subjects i took took courses in mm, you've also said that the original uh, origins of your interest in well i don't know if, if it's correct to say that to be in con contact with the wild already originates in your childhood yeah like i had uh the fortune to have a forest maybe 200 meters by no a bit more less than 400 more than 200 by bmx i had a bmx <laughs> you know bmx bikes yeah. yes so yeah, spend a lot of time in the forest. We would play games there. Our parents would need to get us in, not out. Um, and, and usually that meant that they would drive with the bicycle into the forest and call our names. Um, yeah, so we always played there, um, really mud kids. Uh, and 
and then I started to read like these adventure travel books, um, also survival handbooks started to come. There was one person who was and still he's deceased now is a big idol of mine. Like he was uh, very much the first person who made survival a big topic in Germany, but he was also um, an activist for human and environmental issues. Um, crossed the Atlantic a couple of times, uh, like even on a tree and a float and a rowing boat or paddle boat um, to, to bring attention to the situation of the Yanomami in Brazil. Yeah, so then I started to do these survival trainings on my own, like running through the woods, not using bridges and trails, um, climbing trees, learning what is nowadays called bushcraft skills. Um, and, and like, I really loved sleeping in the woods. Like, I think every free weekend in the army and in the university, I spent somewhere sleeping in the woods, um, sometimes near some climbing rocks, um, often with friends, often with girlfriends. Um, yeah, like it was kind of, it just felt natural to, to rather be there than, I don't know, for me, a night out has always been like a night out, right? Not a night going <laughs> to the pubs. Um, and yeah, and then for some reason, my parents, I think since I was six years old, my family every second summer spent time in Finland just by you know, one of those many coincidences, it, it just happened to be Finland. So every second childhood summer was in, in a place that, uh, back then still felt a lot of, a lot wilder than today. Like when you look at Saima today compared to 85, like, you know, things look very different. Um, <coughs> and yeah, then at some point I always wanted to, somehow work and live in places where these nature documentaries come from, like, you know, nature documentaries with wolves and bears and. Mm. Mm. What does being a wilderness guide consist of for you? Like the practicality of when you, when people come with you? Mm. Practicalities, kind of it starts, like when people contact me, I don't do much marketing or advertising. I have a, a absolutely neglected web page, um, which maybe, I don't know, you can find in the show notes or in the... Um, Nordic by nature, right? Nordicbynature.net, yeah. yes. Um, so people contact me. Um, I've recently gotten a lot of contact through LinkedIn and then mm, usually i like to make tailor-made stuff for people like so i ask people what they want um i try to find out what it is that they actually need often those differ um and then we discuss if we're actually going to do it or not because i have started to not like like I'm, I'm having this conversation on the phone with with the customers or potential customers where we find out if we can justify this use of resource energy time and money is it beneficial or not um it's usually the customer usually has the last word so if they say but we want to come anyway then it's rather be me than some snowmobile safari mm, yeah and then I do anything from two hours to two weeks, um, depending up to 10, 12 people. Mm. 
And then it's like practicalities, like scouting areas, um, deciding activities, like if somebody wants a two hour activity by the cottage, right? Um, to, I don't know, show, learn something about fire making or tracking or fishing or how to improvise a sauna or I don't know how to make a uh, Vichta, like, you know, these birch branch thingies that uh, crazy Finns use to uh, take care of mosquito bites and uh, cleaning their skin actually quite good. Um, yeah, some like whittling stuff. Um, so it's deciding activities, um, organizing equipment, organizing transportation, deciding how food and accommodation will be dealt with. Uh, depending on the needs of the group. Um, <clears throat> and then practically while guiding, I kind of try to be in the background because I want to, like, for example, I like to walk, uh, depending what it is to group. But like, for example, a couple of weeks ago, I had one customer who wanted to spend five days or so in the woods. And he asked me to come with him for the first two days. So I had him walk first, I had him use the map so that um, like he gets a kind of immersion and, and learns to feel safe. And um, then I just, you know, showed mushrooms and some, you know, fire making stuff and shelter building stuff and um, explained something about local fauna flora and um, often also something about Finnish culture and lay of the land, geography. It's, you know, quite a wide area. So then I have also these kind of activities like that. Kind of one of my most frequent customer is like a um, operator who is um, operating these uh, retreats or hiking holidays. So they come to some of these uh, Leire Keskus use wilderness centers, wilderness resorts. And they spend a whole week there as a group. And I just have one one day with them, like a five hour, six hour nature awareness walk. Um, yeah. It's, I used to offer swim hiking traveling on the water also by rowing boats or just using flippers and pulling the backpack behind you. Um, and in the moment, like I have somehow reduced this kind of professional activity of guiding to absolute minimum because activism takes so much time. Also, I want to do more sustainability consulting. Um, there's an uh, overlap in wilderness survival and sustainability and, and nature connection. They're very much the same thing. Um, even even in city environments. So, no. hmm, what else? Practicalities. Um, I'm working through a cooperative for the billing. So there's a work cooperative that also has a lot of nice insurances and I don't need to see any papers. I need to you know, just write a receipt for the customer. That's it. And, and, uh, or, or, or ask, ask the um, bookkeeper at the cooperative to send a, a, a bill to the customer. So I'm, I'm not a paperwork person, so I'm quite happy that there's this cooperative. It, Probably financially not as clever because there's you know more money going you know to pay the bookkeeper and so on, but mm. it's easier for me that way. Mm. Do you have an estimation of what percentage of people come from abroad? Mm, well, more than half. And and I, um, what was it? A couple of two three months ago, there was this um, event organized. Um, something like Saima hospitality or Saima, um, like it was people who work in the tourism industry or also who run restaurants in, in, in Saima area. And there was one event organized in Yoensu and we had this workshop where 
people wrote on the papers, like their future vision, like, you know, in 2025, we want la 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 la, or want to be like this. And somebody had written 80% foreign customers, that they want to have 80% foreign customers. And, and I wrote under it 80% local customers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's tricky to get local customers. Mm. Um, I think this is also illustrative of the dynamic I've been referring to during our discussion when it comes to incentives related to, to changing your ways if you know that people are still going to operate in a certain way. So for example, if you want to guide your company to a more ethical direction and you know that if you push it too far then someone else will take the place and do the thing anyway and i see a similarity here that you know that there are some ethical questions that you're exploring in relationship in relation to the resources that people uh, consume when coming to you but at the same time you know that or that you trust that you have something important to offer and that may be not offered by everyone else who they could uh, choose. I'm even happy when, like, even if I don't get the customer, at least we have had this phone call where mm -hmm. we elaborated if if this is useful. So uh, at least some kind of question stays with the customer. Mm -hmm. um, that's already, like, something I appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sure, there are compromises. Like, I... You know, again, I don't want to tell people like, uh, no, I don't want you here if you come flying. Like, for sure, I I want them rather to come with me than than have someone else serve them because uh, at least I know that uh, I do my best to to offer them something of of life value, like or long lasting value. So. Hmm. Would you talk about the meaning of the wild for you? <laughs> the meaning of the wild. I, I don't think wild has a meaning. Like the wild. Like, what is the meaning of the microbes in our body? I think it's just existence. It's just being and growing and and spreading and I don't know. Like, of course, there's like this. You know, when I when I think of of some nights when I sleep under the tarp outside. And I, I I hear some bigger something moving not too far away from me. Like to me, that is like a very wild moment, right? There's an exposure to you know, there's a vulner vulnerability. Like you know, if I if I hear a bear or see fresh bear prints, then I that I know that there is someone in the area who climbs faster than me, swims faster than me, runs faster than me, uh, and can eat more of me than I can eat of him. <laughs> like, you know, it's, uh, so it's somehow also, also just, you know, just when you go to the woods and leave the map behind and the phone behind, like you have no safety net, right? Like that gives you such a feeling of, or gives me such a feeling of aliveness that I can, yeah, cannot experience anywhere else. Like, you know, it's like climbing without rope. It also gives you really like, you feel very alive when you climb without rope. And, 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 and same, same there. Like you, you're a lot more aware about where you put your foot, you know, because you cannot afford to slip and, and 
you know, break your ankle. You're a lot more aware when you use a knife because you, you know, like you cannot afford to have a wound that can get effect infected. Um, <clears throat> and like in in the Wilderness Guides Association, we have the saying that the the wild holds holds answers to questions we have yet to learn to ask. Um, and so when I when I think about the meaning of the wild, like kind of what does it mean to me, is really like um something very connecting like connecting with myself connecting with other species uh even like also other species individuals like you know you can have a connection with a spider um and it, it really puts things into perspective right like it gives you an idea of of what sufficiency and efficiency really means right if you if you see like a bear this you know the size of a bear and just imagine that about 80 percent of the winter fat of a bear just comes from berries right it, it gives you an idea of, of what is sufficient for you as a much lighter individual having access to the same amount of berries. Of course, we cannot turn it into glucose as uh, easy, uh, into fat as easily as the bear can do. Um, but still, like it's, it's still there as a reminder of, 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 you know, how, how survival works, how life works. Um, and like when, when you, when you're longer time in the woods and you try to feed yourself from the woods and, and resource all the materials you need for your shelter, you're living your fire, then, then then you start not to go, you know, like wandering off your camp in the idea to do something, right? You're not going mountain biking, you're not going hunting, you're not going fishing, you're not going berry picking, you're not going to collect birch bark you're just going you just it's just being like the you know the 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 weight on the brain is a lot less you, you it's it's just existing and and if you if you see berries you take berries if you see mushroom you take mushrooms if you if you can harvest birch bark for for fire making or other tinder then but but you you wouldn't go with the intention to do something specific and and this feeling of like aimless wandering or or just just existing being where you actually feel wild yourself because you know that this is exactly the way that the bear is moving around right um it I don't think I can describe it well enough to be just understood. I think the best thing, like, you know, even if, if one lives in the middle of the city is just to, to do the same, you know, like even in the city, you can wander without, you know, phone and aim and see what happens. And maybe you find something, a conversation or hunt something from the dumpster or, <laughs> It's. Uh, I think this this feeling of being wild or this feeling of being emerged in the wild is something that we can get, like you know, wherever we can breathe or, or have a sip of water, right? Like this little water connection exercise I made when you were on the toilet was like, you know, it's totally wild. It doesn't have a meaning. It's a driving force. I think meaning is not something that's inherently in things, but it's something that emerges through our relationships with mm -hmm. them. And I think your answer actually covered, or not covered, maybe not, not the right word, but it's um, brought me into contact with some aspects of what wild means for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also found myself thinking about, because you like to use the phrase, we nature, 
as a reminder that we are not something apart from the rest of nature but still like i found myself thinking about that you are a wilderness guide and not for example an urban guide or mm. or a, a museum guide mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yet i can do wilderness guiding in the middle of the city yeah sure yeah. Uh, but there's there's something to the if we approach from the we nature perspective there's something particular in environments that are less obviously modified by people mm -hmm. yeah and and sometimes even very modified and not noticeable like by by let's say common people like like um you know when you when you look at forestry like you know tree farms basically like for for a lot of people that is enough to be called a forest right um And and we don't maybe think that this is like a modified place, unless we maybe you know see an aerial picture and see that all the trees are planted in line, or we we see that actually you know when we see a, like let's say a natural forest in comparison and see the biodiversity there, and then we look at the forestry land and and then we start to think like is this still a forest, right? Um, Yeah, I, I think it's one of the quite a, quite a big issue to to have this narrative of like we humans and nature, right? Like, or, or we humans nature. and animals, like you know, not we humans and other animals, yeah. or we humans and the rest of nature, or the the more than human nature, or um. Because it it kind of somehow establishes or keeps a separation in our head that make us either afraid of nature or feel bigger than nature or you know disconnected from it. Um, yeah, that's. I, I think that's really one of the biggest issues in the world is that. We're not having this healthy connection anymore, and and at the same time we are born nature connected. Okay. So it's it's really reassuring to know that nature connection is deep inside of us. Like you know, it's even even in our language, even though we might say, you know, in on the weekend I go spend time in nature, uh, we also have words like that naturally come to our mind like naturally like you know something feels natural like this is somehow you know rooted in us also um where were we at least i wanted to add that when it comes to tree plantations and biodiverse forests i was just yesterday when we were with my wife and daughter we were spending time in the forest um we were talking about how if you haven't spent time in both then it might be that you don't um feel the relevant difference between them because mm. because even the tree plantations have some biodiversity sure. and people maybe just don't notice that the proportion mm. of things is also also relevant mm. so then yeah the, the the difference becomes clearer as you stay in contact mm. with both of them and then you start observing the different manifestations they have yeah, sort of. and even feel it 
like, like, I I I think that if I would you know spend like a lot of time let's say in some disco place you know where there's a lot of noise lots of people and suddenly I would be zoomed out of this in my experience horrible experience <laughs> right and be zoomed into a tree plantation right where there might be some mushrooms and some birds flying and birds singing and and some squirrels running I would feel a lot better there compared to the disco place or some metro station or something. And when I then would come from, you know, a natural old growth forest, which is, you know, far too rare, and then come to a tree plantation, then I would feel like, you know, this is so wrong. Like, this, this place shouldn't exist like this. Um, so, like I like to show customers also clear cuts. Um, it's somehow because you know that you, you like when a lot of the customers they come from urban environments and like for some the tree plantation might be the most forest they have seen in a while, and they might not see that there is something weird or wrong about it. And in a clear cut, it's usually quite obvious. I once had a customer say, like, oh, look at this. So nice how far you can look here. <laughs> um, there are nice aspects to that sort of <laughs> tree fields, too. I, I, I don't know which ones. Well, the experience you just described, but I, I imagine it's harder to see when you are more aware of yeah, what yeah. it implies. Yeah. Hmm. I was once hitchhiking with a truck driver of an empty wood truck. And I asked him, that, like, which is quite rare because trucks usually, you know, once they have picked up speed, they don't want to slow down, but it was a bend and he was slow. And then I, he gave me a ride and I, I asked him, like, you you must see a lot of clear cuts in your life. And he said, oh, yeah, every day. And, and I asked, like, does it ever feel wrong? He said, yeah, always. <laughs> Which somehow is like, you know, telling telling so much about how, like, I don't know who said this. Is it, um, like, imagine there's war and nobody goes. Like, um I, I think it's very similar, like, you know, Im imagine there's like clear cut and nobody, you know, or, or or nobody cuts it, right? Or nobody takes part in the cutting. Um, and we we don't see often how, how what possibilities there are. Might, sometimes we might not have those possibilities that we would like to have to to not take part in something or change something or... Do you feel fear in the wild ever? Not really, like... No, not really. Like, I, I very rarely feel fear anyway, so... I, I think fear might be what I am afraid of, almost. Because I, I, I've seen how paralyzing it can make you uh, paralyzed. It can make. I have to think if there are some. Yeah. 
like like sometimes when when there is like um, you know really big wind like really big storm it's not really fear but it's a bit of a I don't know like get this slight bit of adrenaline when when you're sleeping or want to sleep and you hear like the strong wind and shaking at your tarp and the rain coming down and you hear branches falling in the area or whole trees falling in the area and and even though you know you usually look in the surrounding of 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 your camp like especially when it's a windy day that there's like no dead standing trees that could fall onto you like it's still like let's say you you have some somehow you know especially with customer groups sometimes things change and things take slower or lower uh, longer and then you set up camp in the dark and you cannot really you know check out all the trees and so there's like this slight feeling of like hmm i guess it will be all right <laughs> <laughs> but it, it there's still this a bit of a I don't know. Is it a feeling of Russian roulette, or <laughs> but it's not fear? It's somehow excitement, like adventure. Hmm. I once mm, once witnessed a, a spontaneous falling of a tree, and I don't think it was even like a major storm or anything. Yeah, sometimes like, the tree can just grow too big. Uh -huh. Like if it's on a rocky place where it's not much contact and something happens, you know, like a plant dies that is holding one of the roots, right? Another plant that the roots are rooted between the roots or, you know, some frost crack appears in a rock or like it, or, or it can also be that, uh, you know, the tree is, is, kind of grown to withstand wind from the main wind direction so it's grown really strong in terms of you know how the roots and and branches are balanced around the trunk uh, and in the ground and if then like uh, a slightly stronger wind from an unusual direction comes or maybe there has been a, a road made um, or roots have been cut or like uh, there was a clear cut nearby that can suddenly allow wind to pick up to faster speed so um it's quite unusual for a tree to just fall spontaneously without reason mm -hmm. there I was i was just walking with a friend actually on a road near a field it was not the forest but just a field near malmi lentokent actually and uh i just heard a crack from the trees Near the, near the road and then we kept on walking and after a couple of seconds a tree fell just like over the road uh, to where we had just walked it was like a memorable experience i can imagine it's <laughs> a close call even maybe mm. uh. i also because you mentioned like uh that you hold or that you also offer like two week uh wilderness I don't know if session is the word. Mm, experience. Experience. Um, I was wondering, I don't know if this makes sense, but uh, if you could either like describe a particular two-week uh, experience on w w what it, uh, what one of those contained or, or just like improvise a story of what it could entail just to get the grasp of like. Mm, okay, so like i've never had the pleasure of a two week i'm just offering up to two weeks uh 10 days was the longest i've had with uh, one customer um usually the first i don't know three days uh, are just to arrive you know get into the routines learn how to ski how to you know um stay clean how to like you know just really you know first three days are arrival days which is why almost anything shorter than five days doesn't make much sense like for if, if you want to experience really like how it is to move and and be in the wild um because the first three days they're like 
I, I wouldn't say you can't count them. Of course, they count and bring a lot of experiences. But especially if one, if people want to, you know, like learn something new and and maybe extend like their comfort zone levels. Like you can basically not really start working on those until you already feel comfortable, and that can take a two to three days. Like some people are uncomfortable with pooping in the woods, right? They, it's it's even even on a day trip, right? You you have a group just for a five hour walk, and and people might not join you on this walk because they they are afraid that they might need to poop, right? Like with food, you can deal with it later, right? Or you can carry a snack with you quite easily. But if you if you're if your comfort zone is sitting on a toilet, but you can flush. And you've possibly never experienced squatting. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Then, then it it might even be a reason. Like I've had a, a girl on one group who didn't eat for two days, and I was like thinking, what's what's the issue? And eventually, I discovered it's like she just didn't want to need to poop. Um. So, like, usually people don't poop more than once a day. So just to get this experience of you know feeling comfortable pooping in the woods, you already need th three poops. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I do like to really take things slow. Um, like there's a lot of learning on how to move silent, how to use your senses, right? How to see more and hear more and use your nose and smell. Um, and it's experiencing 50 square centimeters for two hours, right? Laying on your isolation mattress covered with the tarp and sleeping bag. And you just might lay there and watch it's 50 square centimeters for an hour or two. And, and you experience a lot of li wildlife in that time. Right, it's it's something. Often people, especially when they are from outside of Finland, like they they expect to see a lot of kind of big wildlife, right? Compared to, for example, Germany, the game density here of, or the density of bigger game is about ten percent of what is in Germany. So, if people you know have seen occasionally or accidentally some deer or wild boar or something in Germany, and then they come here, they expect to see more, um, which you know, it's like you still want to show them something, <laughs> and and want and and that is like just just looking at the small small spaces and and see how the ants ants interact with each other and other other insects, for example, is like at least as valuable as watching I don't know some moose or so, which is a lot harder to find, especially with a group of you know noisy, colorful backpackers that just come from the hiking store. Mm. Mm. So it's <clears throat> a lot of arriving, um, training senses, doing some exercises of, you know, being comfortable with making fire. And so it's like usually quite, quite slow and, and learning skills, learning how to move, learning even how to slow down, uh, learning to be without the phone. Right. It's like it's uh, you. I did not think that it would be so hard for some people to not not have the phone on them um, and, and watch it every something two hours at least or so. Um, then it's when when I travel, I like to make a mix of using trails and not being on trails because walking on trails, for example, barefoot is not as comfortable as walking off trail barefoot. Um, then I like to um, be quite like, I mean, there is a little balance because when you, when you have a group and you're covering distance, you need to plan in your like risk assessment and rescue plan. You need to have exit points, exit po like, you know, in case, like I don't know, somebody's careless and hurts themselves. That you have ways to get them out. Um, so and so, I like to also 
do swimming routes. So for me, hiking is not just staying on land. Hiking also means crossing waters and not just rivers that you can walk through, but also swimming, um, which is really nice because like a, a lot of lakes in, in Finland are kind of thin and long, right? They're like spread from northwest to southeast, like how the ice traveled. Mm -hmm. And um, they can be really long, but really thin in some places. So you might not have, you know, you might have swimming distance of a couple of hundred meters. Whereas if you want to walk around this lake, you need like maybe a half a day or a whole day, depending on your on your speed of movement. Um, so I really like water travel allows you also to, you know, sleep on islands or, you know, go into areas where you otherwise would maybe go only if you had a, a canoe or something. And I don't do canoes, kayaks, uh, rafts anymore. Anything that you need for side-based transportation like cars, I don't do those anymore. Um, I used to guide rafting in Rona like very very vehicle heavy you know this white water rafting no well, requires vehicles to bring the rafts and the people around and back and forth and then you might need uh two cars to drive the driver back to the beginning of the you know it's it's quite insane so um usually towards the end when people like kind of my my aim is that whatever activity people do with me even if it's short that afterwards they feel safer and more confident to go out on their own right like I, th this is kind of the the gate i want to open to them that they feel like okay this is a place i want to go again and like not necessarily this place but like you know out in the whatever wild uh they consider wild or experience like that they've you know develop a passion and a desire and and uh, a feeling of safety to go to those places on their own uh always friends um and <clears throat> if the stay is long enough i like to offer an opportunity for solo in the usually second last night because the last night is usually close to exit point uh trailhead or close to transportation again and the last night i like to organize for a sauna either a self-made sauna from a tent or have a sauna that is somewhere available for for rent or higher um and again big differences between winter hiking or or uh, summer other seasons right when you when you can ski and pull pull sledges some sometimes you, you know people want to spend the whole day ice fishing and then have this little smoking box and then we can you know on the sledges like this archio when you pull them like weight is not that much of an issue if you only do like a week or so like so you can you know carry heavier equipment like a cast iron frying pan and uh, you know box for smoking fish and so it's a bit more despite the cold winter has some more comforts also that summer doesn't have mm. yeah and then really what people want like they want to learn I don't know, making primitive fire, like without modern fire tools, or do they want to, you know, learn how to improvise fishing equipment from natural materials? Or um, I, I really like to offer this. I mentioned the solo and solo night um, because it's where I feel like whatever has happened before, you know, it's kind of where you. It, it, it's 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 like pushing the safe button you know that that things can you know people can process and and be on their own and because this is actually like the most valuable time like even when i'm with the people i know the most valuable time is if they are without me right when you know when they're really alone um i also like to play these kind of hiding games where you know people are ending up in a situation where they're laying on the ground and not moving because it's a hiding game right with a group especially with kids and that can like create situations where 
suddenly you have a spider walking over your hand and you cannot move, <laughs> right? Which is, um, yeah, I wouldn't want to say forced nature connection, but it's, um, you know, you're, you're, you're creating these moments where nature connection can happen. And, you know, that if this happens to someone who doesn't even feel safe or, or comfortable sitting down, but during a game, you know, like these, these, um, personal comforts, they can often disappear, um, because it's a game and it's fast and there's like excitement going on. And then people like can forget about like this not wanting to sit on the ground without them a pad underneath and then suddenly they lay in the ground and maybe even in the mud and get their clothes dirty and mm. Mm. something else that is really important for me is that like the wilderness doesn't stay where it is but that it travels inside the customer wisdom wherever they go including the principles of wilderness survival like that they you know, like when, when we are out in the woods, it's much easier to understand what it means to take care of your six survival priorities. And when you then go back to um, what people used to maybe describe as the safe civilization, like then they see that, you know, they, then they can easily notice all the detours. You know, like when, when you come from a, a week from the forest and then you're suddenly on a road, you know, it's like this, when people walk on the road after a week in the forest, you can see in their face that walking on the road feels weird. You know, it doesn't feel quite right. And when then a car comes, or 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 like I, I um, sometimes because I don't use cars on my own, like I don't have a car for transporting customers, so I use public transport or bicycles. And sometimes I call a, a taxi to pick us up to get us out and um, then just compensate the, the carbon, but compensation is always kind of a last resort. But anyhow, so that, that when this, this taxi comes and then the people sit there and, and suddenly like they have been driving three kilometers that they, you know, traveled in one day in, I don't know, less than five minutes or something with the car, like, you know, that does something with people. And, and, and I hope that this feeling like stays with them for longer than just for that moment of being in the taxi. And that they also understand, for example, how to judge a survival situation. That survival situation is not, not that extreme situation that people exp imagine to happen when you are in the wild. Or, or stranded somehow, or something happens, but survival situation is is our everyday life story in the city, like because we qualify in pretty much all priorities for being in one. Yeah, I think we'll go into that uh, mm. in a more in depth in a, in a while. Maybe because you now already for the second time mentioned the six survival priorities. I think you probably listed them before, but let's explicitly like list them here just uh, for later reference. Yeah, so so I should say that this is a list that I put together according to my best understanding. So when I first heard about survival priorities was when I saw Maslow's pyramid of um, priorities, you know, this Maslow's pyramid, which has yeah, now your been- Hierarchy of needs. Hierarchy of needs, yeah, which has now, you know, there are many more accurate models these days than that. Um, and, and for example, their community and health was not listed, right? Um, also, culture is really on top of the of, of, of the pyramid there, where else culture is actually part of community, right? Without culture, you cannot have community, like a culture of greeting each other, a culture of gratitude, a culture of, you know, helping each other or so. Um, so, um, yeah, the six priorities are food, water, air, shelter, health, and community that's like i've been thinking about this list for many years at some point like health appeared to me later i didn't think of health for a long time i thought it was four at first and then five and then i realized it's actually six and i might still be missing something but now i've been thinking about this list of six priorities for probably 15 years now and i think it's quite inclusive so 
Did the realization of health being relevant come to you through an encounter with the loss of health, or mm, no? It's um, it's it's like I, I remember the uh, story of um, like in my brother's school class, there was a child that had was born with a, a heart heart issue, and and I was thinking about this and realized, okay, this this kid had community when when being born, right? Like it had community to feed him, uh, to give water, to provide shelter, um, had apparently air to breathe, but just those five alone were not enough, right? Because there was a health issue. So, and community took care of the health issue. Community is always the one that can back up for lack of the other ones. It's like kind of that's the, the how do you call it? The top ace is the community. Mm. Yeah, even air, if you got enough high tech. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Or, or well, without tech also, like CPR. Well, I mean, just even even the air we breathe, you know, is it polluted or are there sufficient mm -hmm. amount of plants around to filter the air and, and, and bring you oxygen, so. Sure, but yeah, I was thinking of acute situations. Yeah. Does the word CPR refer to, or does it contain mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing? Or yeah, CPR? it's circular and pulmonary. So it's like air breathing system and heart system. Yeah. Okay. Um, Wait. No, actually, CPR is. It's me. It means compression, pressure, respiratory. I don't know. I need to. <laughs> okay. Don't quote us on that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. One final thing re regarding what you've been talking about here about walking in the wild. And you mentioned that walking bare feet on, on uh, trails uh, compared to just going off the trails. And like, I'd be interested to hear what are the aspects that feel relevant to you there. Because at least for me, like, of course, trail compared to a road, like with asphalt or something, is like, especially when going bare feet, it's just like uh, the trail is so, so much more pleasantly stimulating and diverse but of course then when you go off the trail then it's all the more more diverse both when it comes to textures that your feet or soles are in contact with and also like uh, the uh, differences in in mm -hmm. height that is not just flat but what are the aspects that feel like i i should say that there are places where it's good to stay on the trails right it's to to minimize the area where impact is happening. Also, other animals in this area are used for humans to be on the trails. So they might be nearby and not alerted if humans walk through, but if you divert five or 10 meters from the trail, you might scare them and that might make them use unnecessary energy. Um, then there are also areas where it's, if you walk off trail, it's usually better not to walk behind each other. You'd make a new trail, uh, but walk next to each other. Um, I also do not go with groups into boggy areas. Um, boggy? Uh, bog, swamp, sewer. Uh -huh, yeah. like, or in, in general, very fragile terrains. I do not like to enter, especially if people wear boots. You know, like uh, hiking boots and barefoot is a bit like you know four-wheel drive and mountain bike in comparison so you leave a lot make a lot more damage with hiking boots also if people carry heavy backpacks is not so nice to um you know like it it it, it uh, has more impact on 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 the mosses on the plants and whatever um then regarding the pleasures like i can walk barefoot a lot faster on a road then I can walk on a forest trail. Usually forest trails are not so nice to walk barefoot because the ground is compacted and roots and stones are exposed, which are really hard. So I can walk faster off trail than on the trail barefoot. If you walk barefoot off trail, like in a normal forest, you will not grow you know, a thick layer of leather under your foot. It's just no abrasion will happen. It's just soft. Um, 
something to bear in mind is when walking barefoot is that the legs are designed to absorb the energy of each step and use the energy stored in the calf muscles for the next step when you when when you watch like children learning to walk they walk on the tiptoes more on the front feet and that's how how the legs are designed to walk to absorb the energy and that actually allows you to feel pain or like painful potentially painful spots or or loud stuff right if you want to be silent you will feel like if something is painful or noisy before you put your whole weight on it well if you walk heel strike first like what we uh, kind of modern footwear makes us do with the higher bigger cushioned heel when you walk heel strike first all the weight is immediately there um like you can you can even feel this if you walk uh, make an exercise like just take off the shoes and and walk a few meters and put your fingers in your ears or close your ears or put some earmuffs on if you walk heel strike first you will hear actually you know the the kind of the shock of mm -hmm. your bone hitting the ground and and all this energy can then easily go in the knees so especially when you have knee problems it's good to walk barefoot but front foot first to have a little bounce in it and and be elastic um yeah and there's so much about barefoot walking um like usually barefoot walking is pleasant as long as you also don't need gloves right if if the temperatures go down so far that you want to wear gloves then you might also want to wear shoes um but until then like even if it's wet autumn weather and eight degrees or so if you're still fine without gloves you'll probably still be fine without shoes mm. yeah oh, very beneficial <laughs> very connecting uh, actually like also um um i, I don't I, i'm trying to recall this correctly like from what I understand is that the earth itself has a negative electric charge. And when we walk with footwear that is, uh, you know, electricity uh, in isolating, the um, static electricity in our body through fabrics moving together, um, like it's a positive. So when you walk barefoot, you actually get the same charge as the earth, which apparently is is good for you um somebody should look this up <laughs> <laughs> sounds potentially suspicious but interesting yeah hmm. Hmm. but also you get a lot more information i mean mm, like yeah. just the 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 sense of touch like you don't need to look for places let's say if you want to look for a sleeping place you can just walk over the sleeping place and you feel it's warm, dry, soft, even. You feel sticks in there that you don't need to sit down on your knees and move them away. You can even grab the branches and pine cones there with your toes and throw them out of the way. So it's really convenient. Very also good for climbing. You have really good traction. You can, you know, grab around rocks and you yeah. can wrap even with the barefoot footwear, you know, these thin foot shoes. You can you know, already have much better grip, like kind of wrapping your foot around rocks instead of rolling over them. Mm. <coughs> yeah, I think using the feet as grappling devices is underestimated or undervalued. And I really love picking things up with my, my toes. And that's also one thing that um, I got more into uh, during the first year of our child, because then when you have your like hands taken by holding the baby then you learn to like Open just the door balance. with your feet yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and balance with one foot and pick things up from the floor and yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, i really wish that uh or yeah uh, um i love the idea that I, I might be able to encourage her also to use her feet in that sense more than uh, um, people generally do because i imagine when you learn it when you're really young it's uh, much more easier to uphold the skill later oh yeah like like when i look at how well people who 
are left-handed can work with their left hand or how well people who have no hands can use their toes and feet to just do things like, you know, anything from writing computer to whatever. Like where I feel like, okay, I don't have that control over my toes. Um, so there's like a huge, huge, um, I don't know. I, I think we automatically use them more when, when we can use them, right? If they're packed in shoes, we just cannot use them and then we don't. Mm. Mm. Also regarding the the way you step when you are going bare feet and uh, also like the amount of information you get, it's interesting that when you do step into places that are more harsh, for, for your souls. Uh, it's fascinating how you naturally slow down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I often find myself start breathing deeper because, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. one common example is if I walk through this, you know, pebble, sora, sora mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, s some types of this pebble are are quite harsh yeah the it's feet. probably the most painful terrain to walk on yeah yeah and but then when you when you slow down and start breathing yeah, then yeah. then it becomes a lot easier yes i I'm, I'm always saying that there is no terrain that you cannot walk barefoot maybe lava or <laughs> something but um but it's it's there are many terrains where you cannot walk faster than you can Right, so even if you if 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 feet are untrained, right, like that there is no, you know, very only these very soft skin feet that have been you know wearing shoes all life long, like of course you can walk barefoot. Just do it in the speed that suits you, like and and and, and the feet tell you what is the right speed. In addition to lava, for example, some rocks that have been heated by the sun. Oh yeah, the can be, yeah, That's, same as asphalt. Yeah, be very yeah, yeah definitely. And of course, cold. I found my. Uh, but by the way, very nice if you have like walking on ice or harsh snow is just to wear socks, mm -hmm. like socks and barefoot, no shoes. Mm -hmm. It's it's really good. Um, even in winter, you have extremely good grip because you get this layer of ice under the wound socks, and that connects really. It's like glue. Mm. Interesting. Hmm. Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh yeah, I was just saying that I found my uh, my limits for for the amount of cold where uh, w going bare feet was too much for me because I had a couple of years ago I had a winter where I was uh, going into the Avanto, uh, I was swimming every day and uh, I walked back home bare feet and uh it depended like around zero where the snow is more wet it's mm, much oh, more difficult yes. so when it's a bit colder and it's not as wet it's easier but yes. still i found that after minus five it becomes too much and i had one experience of uh, getting like some sort of damage to my feet mm. from the cold and that's where yeah. i realized that, okay five minus five is too much or i, I mean like much for me. you, you you can only get frostbite if it's minus mm -hmm. and, and especially if you have been in the avanto and the whole circulation like is is limited mm -hmm. already like because their vessels are constricted um like then then you can more easily even on short distances you can really freeze mm. yeah but it was a good experience to go through that without any permanent damage because uh yeah i wanted to explore my boundary and i found it yeah was it a good experience in the moment or especially afterwards um in the moment i just felt that it's very cold and that i'm at my limit uh after a couple of hours i went to pick up a package from uh, a place where they well, where they um, bring the post oh, when you've ordered packages over the post, and then the 
whatever lockers are full and they bring it to wherever that's very far away from where you would like to yeah. fetch that from and i was just like going to fetch a, a package and then during that i started feeling so it was i think six hours after the exposure or something i started feeling that my shoes feel uh, surprisingly small for me and uh I started feeling more and more like this sensitive, irritable, sensitive feeling in my foot, yeah. feet, and uh, it was really painful. And yes. I, I was unsure whether, uh, unsure of whether I had caused some permanent damage, and they got swollen and red. And I don't know, maybe it lasted for a couple of days or something. Yeah. And I took a break from ice swimming for a couple of days too. Mm. Uh, but uh, but yeah, afterwards, because I learned something from that, and I also just like got to know at least at that stage my limit uh, I, I really appreciate that experience and i like to get like i appreciate when i get warning shots that are like uh, very uncomfortable but don't cause any permanent problems yeah, yeah. i but, once but had dengue fever and survived and and I'm really grateful for this experience, uh, even though I, I would, you know, if somebody goes to an area where there's dengue fever, I always hope that, like, I hope you don't get dengue fever. Um, but having survived it and having experienced, like, you know, this time where survival was a question mark and pain was very present and fever was very present and very strange dreams are very present, I'm so grateful for having experienced that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, frost nip or frost bite, they are painful in the thawing process. Um, in particular, if you manage to freeze them again. You know, it's like what happens to mate if you put a tomato in the freezer, take it, put it in, take it out, let it thaw, put it back in. Uh -huh. You know, it will look horrible. And so, so if you if you have a frostbite, make sure it doesn't freeze again. Uh -huh. um, and like sometimes it's even better to keep it frozen if you cannot guarantee that it will stay warm from now on right okay so it's better to keep it frozen than thaw it later when you know you have a stable environment mm. um but it, it will be painful especially like in the weeks afterwards mm -hmm. um not pleasant <laughs> hmm. okay um i'm asking uh, at this point we've talked for four and a half hours mm -hmm. and uh just to make sure that there's uh that's okay. It's now fifteen past seven. That's okay to go on. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about the nomad town. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we talked about the yurt in the big beginning, and mm -hmm. uh, the yurt is located in what uh, a tiny fraction of the people. Uh, of the humans living on planet Earth called the Nomad Town. So, mm. yeah, what's the Nomad Town? Okay, so Nomad Town is, uh, the name was created by a friend of mine, greetings. Um, and the idea was that, or still is, that since this piece of land is available for me to use, I can also give access to other people. Um, and it kind of was the idea that since in North Korea there uh, is and was no eco-village, that at least there can be a bit of an eco-community close to the city of Yuensu. Only issue with this place is that you need to have a mobile shelter. So I've had a lot of people, especially when I was still on Facebook, who wanted to come and live there. And... Um, they asked, like, can I move in where? Are there some rooms available or what is the situation? It's like, no, you need to have your own shelter, um, which turned most people down. Um, and um, there were some people who, or there are some people who have been there or come by every now and then with their own shelters. Um, 
I've been someone with a mobile home living there for over a year. People with tents, hammocks. Um, somebody had built a tiny house there, uh, but then had to sell it, needed money, and um, sold the house and moved elsewhere. Um, and like the idea is that it's a place for people who are kind of living on the move where they can touch base and spend time um, while they are moving through. So there's also a network for these long distance cyclists. So I have a lot of those uh, long distance cyclists that come by and spend a night or two there. Uh, usually in the summer, it's a bit more busy than in the winter. There have been two summers ago for quite some time. We were, I think, eight people there. Uh, in the winter, it's usually me, my son, and um, my partner coming over sometimes. Um, so, and then of course, this whole, if you want so, village is movable, right? If If suddenly the landowners would say that they want to use the place, then I can move with the yurt and everything to another place. So, and then the nomad town can be in another location. Um, now that I'm not on Facebook anymore and uh, mostly on LinkedIn, I haven't gotten anybody coming to nomad town through LinkedIn. Um, but people like come and want to also learn, like they have last year been no this year it was uh in the spring somebody for a month who came from the us who wanted to learn about sustainable living don't know how did she find out about me i don't know no she listened to the uh transnatural perspectives podcast um then there was a girl from japan in the summer for a couple of days who wanted to learn about sustainability so yeah, it's quite it has been also very colorful and fast five years. Um and and a lot of change on the place, the people like you know, last year the summer kitchen looked different than this year. So there's a summer and the winter kitchen, the winter kitchen because in you know, you don't want to make food in the yurt when it's warm and rainy, maybe, because it's just getting too warm in the yurt. So I have a summer kitchen where there's a different twig stoves, wood stoves that burn quite clean um, using just sticks from the forest. Mm, that's the summer kitchen. There's a sauna, there's a well, mm, there are solar panels, mm, there's a garden, there's food growing, there's a forest with berries and mushrooms growing and Mm, what else is there? The river is not too far away. And it's somehow a nice mixture of countryside living and city living because it's really on the edge of UN, so it's just seven kilometers from the marketplace. So there's a bus stop right uh, right at the same street. Um, so it's quite easy to reach. And I um, thought it would be a nice place for people to you know, you, you could live there and continue with your normal city lifestyle, right? You could live there and go to work in the city, just um, try out different lifestyle sizes or speed or designs. I don't know what is the word. Mm, yeah, it was um, when it started um, an experiment of, you know, just having a place for myself that is also open to others and something that for example in nomad town we don't use fossils like there's no diesel generators or anything no no uh, no chainsaw you know that kind of petrol power tools um and yeah it's also a place where it's yeah, experimentation with different approaches, um, different, like, for example, um, I built this muscle power plant, right, where I can charge five USB devices uh, just with a kind of converted home trainer. Um, 
and yeah, like just the experimentation, exploration place, and the place for sharing and meeting. Like um, this summer, we've been hosting two camps, uh, and I had a uh, um, student group coming from the university a couple of weeks ago. Um, there was a group of German forest youth coming for a week. Um, sometimes organizing courses there, meetings of different local associations that are involved with change making. Like uh, we had a group meeting of Kortuswara group there, for example. Um, and then there is uh, a sauna routine, so where neighbors might come and join to the sauna and. Yeah, that's that's the nomad town. Mm. Mm. It's about one hectare of open land that I rent, and then there are five and a half hectares of forest that I'm allowed to use beyond everyone's right. So I can take some wood from there and have survival courses there also. Yeah. By the way, how how much electricity do you make uh, f with uh, it's, it's a bike, right? Yeah, like um, I needed the bike because my very first solar panels were thirty years old and too small, um, and they were not enough in the winter to to even charge phone and headlamp. Um, and then I made this bike where I can charge five USB devices at the same time. And of course, USB is charging slow. Like, you know, when you plug in your phone, it takes one and a half hours or so. Um, so it takes one and a half hours of paddling uh, or two hours of paddling every second day if I use phone a lot um, in the winter. And the paddling is really as easy as going downhill in the first year. Is really not much resistance. It's like almost too too easy. It's like kind of inconvenient, almost how how little resistance there is. Um, and you cannot adjust that. Uh, no, the the thing is, like if I had a bigger battery in between, but I'm charging directly, so it's a it's 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 a DC output, and I'm charging directly the the devices that have inbuilt batteries. So if I had a bigger battery, like a twelve volt battery in in between, then I could pedal harder for a shorter time and then charge the devices from the big battery. Um, which is, in my opinion, not, I, I think it's much better to charge directly than having a bigger battery in between because it's one component less, so it's like less losses. Um, and also at some point, like the battery would need to be replaced. And from what I have researched is that like in the use lifespan of the battery right all this if i would if i would do this every day paddle like i don't know put a hundred watt in this battery every day um after a couple of years i need a new battery so from what i've researched is that the amount of energy that i would produce in this every day a hundred watt is less energy than what was required to produce the battery in the first place. So unless you go for second-hand batteries or work with other energy storage systems, um, that's uh, not as sustainable as I would like it to be. Hmm. Yeah. Do you have a, like any longing for people to more permanently live with, with you there? Mm. Yes. Like, particularly like this time in, in the summer where there's a lot of people coming through, can be very exhausting. Um, it's, it's also similar, like, you know, sometimes people come there and they want to try something and they have no idea how to put up their tent, how to use the black kitchen. You know, it takes like again a couple of days for them to learn the place and learn where you know everything is and and how everything works. 
and if then they only want to come for two days it's like exhausting because you need to take or need to take care of them and do things for them with them help them um so then i'm always like oh, and everybody's always like oh, nice even though i really love the people like mm. that's not the thing um but yeah, like having having more permanent setup, a more permanent crew there would be really nice. Um, there is a new project on the horizon in North Karelia that has the the cat has dragged in. Uh, and that's a previous research station of the university uh, near Ilomansi. Um, quite a big project with uh, opportunity to be an eco village, a research center, a, a retreat place, a course center, like for sustainability education, um, Leirica schools, like uh, for school camp schools, um, for conferences, seminars, it's a really big place. Like, and that place is something that I'm working on in the moment. And I'm not going to tell much more about it because it's, yeah, it's, in the making and really promising at the same time also really big it is really big <laughs> mm. yeah you've also shared the yurt with other people besides your your son and yeah and your partner. In, in the first year there was a friend who um like she and her son they had problems with inside air and it was easier for them to be in the yurt and in their apartment and um, we got along quite well and so they were living with me in the yurt in the first winter well, most of the time yeah um yeah yurt living is a bit like you know like living in a ship you know it's like everything is you know somehow a bit cramped <laughs> you know you need to be tidy and you need to you know like if you want to move this use the sewing machine you might need to move things out of the way because the table for the sewing machine is used for something else when you're not using it for sewing or so but yeah it works quite quite well i like it um Oh, I, I would actually love to talk about the Mekriyarvi project, um, but I, I'm, you know, holding my horses because I know it's good not to rush what I want to do fast. Um, I'm in the moment looking for leadership team members, like fellows who want to to join. Um, but I think there will be more information on this coming now. Hmm. Mm. Regarding the practicality of the uh, practicalities of the yurt, you also have a, an indoor toilet. Yeah, like I have. Um, <clears throat> so in the in the kitchen, first of all, I have uh, a foot pump to pump the water that I carry in the canister from the well. So I have a foot pump, so I have my hands free. It's like a called galley pump that you pump with your foot, and then you have your hands free, and you can. You know switch on the water or off basically works without electricity i have a fridge on the ground so in the middle of the year i can open the floor and then i have a fridge which is all year round under 10 degrees around eight degrees going down to four in the winter um, in the summer we also have two of kind of similar fridges outside um, then i have um, two compost toilets one is inside the yurt which i'm basically not i'm not using that in the summer um but it's just like a, a so-called um how do you call it lovable loo is the system i think it's called lovable loo ah oh. go on i just switch on one of the lights okay so if we put timer uh-huh interesting which timer is it it's just for the plant <clears throat> yeah so it's it's a it's a dry toilet like without smell so even even inside um the trick is to use sawdust um from um uh, from from resinous wood so it binds the smell and the moisture and then once there's this kind of there's a bucket in a box with a toilet seat on top and um then you can 
carry it out and put it on the compost, like human work compost. And uh, yeah, what I want to ask about also, or or actually I know about this, but the listeners are probably interested that you can quickly, you, you don't need to have the yurt warmed up all the time and you can quite quickly warm oh, yeah. it up. Yes, that's really nice. Like, like um, I, I mean, the yurt taught me how to live in a yurt, right? I had no idea how to live in a yurt and didn't know what I need to know, but the yurt kind of taught me how to live in a yurt. Um, so one of this, like, shelter criteria is warm, dry, and safe. So for the warm, the thing is, like, my body needs to be warm. My shelter can also be my clothing or a sleeping bag. Like, right? if you only have a warm sleeping bag and keep it dry, and you, you know, are able to add calories to your body, then you don't need a shelter that you can heat, right? So, for example, if I come home and it's 12 degrees inside, um, I usually don't feel like the need to heat. I might just sit under, you know, just put a blanket over me when I'm sitting on the bed. I have this kind of sofa couch thing on the bed. Um, so I create this warm microclimate around me. Um, ventilation is important to to have some ventilation in the yurt um, to keep things dry, especially if you cook inside. Um, and yeah, the the heat is interesting because like my shelter doesn't need any electricity when I'm not there. Like a, a modern house, summer or winter, if there's electricity breakdown, either the pipes freeze or the ventilation stops and it starts molding. So the shelter breaks if there's no electricity. The yurt, I have the option to not be home and not heat it while I'm there, not there. And also in the in the winter night, like if I go to sleep, um, I usually don't keep the fire on. Like when my son is sleeping over, then I put an alarm every 90 minutes or so, and then I just put another log on so that in the morning there is still a good warmth. But in general, like if I wake up and it's, let's say, minus 30 outside, I just wake up from the, you know, I, I'm, I'm warm in the bed, right? Then I wake up, put on my down jacket, and there might be minus something inside. I go to the stove, put the stove on in half sleep. I don't really wake up from that and go back to bed. When I wake up half an hour later with my other alarm, then the yurt is warm, porridge water is ready, uh, tea water is ready. And that's, I, I think it's quite convenient. Mm. And you have connected to your stove, you have this water heater that looks like something you would have in a sauna yes like i have a water heater where the kind of the stove pipe goes through the water tank so i have like all the time warm water um i've um in the beginning i bought wood from uh, like my neighbor who has a firewood business because i wanted to have a comparable amount you know i wanted to have like standard market firewood um, so I can compare how much firewood I use. So in the, um, like to compare it, for example, to the house I was living in, where we also had the wood heating. And so now I'm in the kind of coldest winter time. I'm using one cubic meter of birch to heat the sauna, heat my food, heat the space and heat hot water one cubic meter for everything, which is quite good considering that you per could month. per month. If considering that you could share that with three people. Like Yeah. And and if I want, I could have plus thirty inside when it's minus thirty outside. 
but I don't want that. And there's usually areas of different temperatures in the yurt. So in the in the north, um, I, I like to sleep in the north. The kitchen is in the south. The entry is in the east towards the morning sun. So um, at the in the south at the kitchen stove area, there can be thirty degrees, and then there will be maybe 18 or 19 in the sleeping area, which is quite pleasant. On your YouTube channel, you have all sorts of interesting videos um, regarding many of the different things we've talked about today, and, and some of them are regarding the practicalities of, of living in that setting. And for example, in one video you showed... Um, this tweak that I understood you made to the yurt, uh, some. Uh, oh yeah, that's cable. the air condition. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that too. Yeah, that's the other one that I was going to mention, and also the one that kept the uh, lock thing from freezing. You had some loop that uh, when the water pours down. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like so, so there is a a a, a cover over the crown of the yurt. In the very top, there is a f fabric cover that I can pull to the side and open. The middle of the roof and you know it looks almost like a pupil from the eye and you can look up into the sky so sometimes you it feels, feels like a bit like a spaceship you know <laughs> because uh, you can just look up and see see space um and so when this this crown cover is attached to the ground in four points with some straps to some ground anchors so that the cover stays on and it would probably even hold the yurt down if it were really, really stormy. But um, the um, when the water runs down, when it's raining or snow is melting, and the water runs down, it will would hit the the kind of the straps or the 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 locks of the straps that I adjust to open or close the roof. And if they get frozen, then I cannot open them. So I tied little pieces of string to those straps that when the water runs down the strap, it will hit the string and then drip down the string instead of running all the way to the lock. Is that what you meant? Yeah. 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 And also, yeah, talk about the ventilation. Oh, it's, it's just that the crown cover is laying directly on the roof. So it will totally seal the opening. So I have a, a long stick where I tied a or actually screwed a tennis ball. I made a hole in a tennis ball and screwed the tennis ball to the end of the stick. So then I can push this tennis ball between the crown and the crown cover. And then there is this little gap for air to, to move out. And then there is ventilation and no mold. Hmm. Are there other like, uh, easily explainable, interesting hacks like that that you've done? To, to make things work better because it's really interesting because I'm not myself a practical person in that sense or at least up to this point in my life I have not developed those skills and it's fascinating to hear uh, like about that kind of um, stuff very practical thing is how I wash myself like I either wash in the sauna um, I mean this whole laundry system right is is I think really interesting like it starts by choosing when to wear what. So I have like city clothes, I have home clothes, and I have forest clothes. Um, the the forest clothes I hardly ever wash. Um, city clothes I hardly ever wear. <laughs> and um, and then the the home clothes I just try not to sweat. So when I'm at home, like, and if it's a warm day or if I'm doing something warm, I'm taking off clothes to not sweat. So if I sweat, I would need to wash the clothes more often. So I, I, I kind of the my system starts by avoiding having to wash, uh, and then about washing myself is like that. I just use a bowl where I can put a couple of liters of water, and then um, I take take it outside with me even in the winter, and stand on an isolation mattress. And then I use a, um, a washcloth or a sponge to just wash myself with that water. And like two, three liters are really enough for, for whole body wash. Um, like I would not have thought that I could get by with so little water and have the feeling that, yeah, this is actually like the last liter is almost luxury. Like 
um, where I feel like, okay, I'm ready to wash, but I still have a liter, nice. So, and it's warm, yeah. Yeah. Other hacks, mm, headlamp. Headlamp is like, um, the light is always where you need it. And my headlamp has a, uh, uh, the lowest setting is somewhere like four lumens, which means that I could have the headlamp on, I think running for almost for a whole week. Uh, it takes very little energy to charge it again. And um, yeah, it's really sufficient, like compared to having lights everywhere that I already did when I was still living in the house that I would like when I was alone at home, I was just walking around with the headlamp and all the lights were off. Um, Hmm. Good hack is thermos bottles, or also you, you know this uh, Aromi Pesa is like a kind of insulated container where you can classic Ostostev uh, yes. device. It's it's such an excellent thing. Like I, in all my stove, I basically only have one plate, right? So um, one of the things I do is I like you know get the I don't know whatever beans pasta whatever. Uh, I use a lot of buckwheat. Um, so when I got it to a boiling, then I just put it in this insulated cozy. It's like hay box cooking. Maybe somebody has heard hay box cooking. So and then I can have the plate free to fry something or do something else with it. A uh, thermos bottle, like for example, in the evening if I have a fire going, I boil a liter or two of water and fill it in thermos bottles. And then I have like um, hot enough water for morning drink, morning porridge, uh, just from this. And in general, thermos bottles are amazing. Like to also, if, if anybody has an electric kettle standing at home, put a thermos bottle next to it in case you boil a bit too much water, put it in the thermos and save it. And then Use use that water if you want to heat new water. Then it's already on a temperature before you start. Um, heating water takes a lot of energy compared to heating air, so um, especially to boiling. Um, so it's really good to to keep it hot once it's hot. Mm. Oh yeah, I mean there's loads of examples like you know if you dumpster dive more bread than you can eat to dry it, then it stores longer. It doesn't mold away. Um, I don't know, loads of hacks. <laughs> um, yep. Okay, regarding the philosophy of what you're doing, uh, one thing that you uh, refer mm, Nomad Town as is a resilience hub. Yeah. So, what is a resilience hub? So, a resilience hub is a place where um, you try to achieve resilience with a community, ideally, or it can only work with community. But also where um, we research like approaches of higher level sustainability, like some low tech stuff, for example, or tools that can lead to resilience. Um, so it's to explore and to share, and like if you if you search online for resilience hubs, uh, you can find different um let's say interpretations of it so you might find uh, some business park has one building that is a resilience hub where where all the infrastructure is like off the grid so that um you know the servers can continue even though there's a greater grid breakdown for example right so kind of resilience in terms of the the electricity or 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 or, or data processing infrastructure. Um, hmm. And like when I when I think of the Nomad Town, what it does is like 
a lot of people who come and spend some time there kind of it's a bit like a diving board at the swimming pool you know people come and jump off from it into into something else so it's like kind of a hub that is like um kind of where people can come together and you know get information for example about different ongoing projects elsewhere and can go from there onwards to something else so it's like a you know when you think of a train station as being a hub also like it's a bit like that too mm. yeah and and i think that resilience hubs like they don't need to be for example off grid right they can be you know three or four floors or three or four apartments inside an apartment building can form a resilience hub in their own by just you know growing a, a tighter knit community a stronger connection among neighbors like to have you know a, a routine or, or 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 possibility to share tools and books and i don't know free time like games and sports equipment or share meals together like it will grow the resilience like you're more resilient to to um like impact on critical infrastructure but also you're less impacting critical infrastructure because you're more independent of it and thus like putting less pressure on those systems how do you define resilience well, resilience is like um, often described as like you know if if uh, if you if you drop an egg to the floor it breaks if you drop a rubber ball it compresses and then it jumps back up right so this resilience is like that you're you're more resistant to um, to outside um, forces and you're more independent on your own and what else is resilience like you, you kind of you can withstand troubles better than as if you're not resilient um I mean, it's it's little things that you know increase resilience like you know like it's it's uh like you know if you get a vaccination you're more resilient to viruses like you know if you well if the virus and the vaccine if they match Right. So it's a little bit like this. You you add something, um, let's say um, a free skilling evening, like once a week that the community meets and somebody shares a skill with the rest of the group, right? And suddenly everybody has this skill. And in case that person who used to have, who was the only possessor of that skill, if that person drops out because he, she moves away, then the skill is still remained in the group and and still they can you know let's say uh fix their trousers if they break right mm. i'm also thinking about nassim nicholas taleb's categorization can you say again nassim nicholas taleb um he has this categorization where there's fragility resilience and then anti-fragility mm -hmm. and anti-fragility is maybe could be described as a sort of resilience where straining the system actually improves it not just that it's like a, 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 a able to sustain mm -hmm. uh, stress but 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 for example like from the perspective of wanting to grow muscle a muscle is anti-fragile mm. in the sense mm. that when you stress the muscle it grows and it mm. makes it more functional in the in the thing that you want to do even though it. you damage the muscle actually yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 like during one time yeah. yeah um i'm also thinking about because one one way of framing resilience is that there's a trade-off relationship between efficient eff efficacy or efficiency and resilience that if you have too much efficiency you probably have too little resilience but if you have too much resilience you have too little efficiency which is caused by because uh, maybe resilience often uh, means that you need to take into account different 
types of stressors that you you need to be able to sustain from or is sustain from proper english but yeah whatever mm. have you thought about this distinction um, i'm i'm thinking that this efficiency and resilience like like instinctively i would think that the more efficient you are the more resilient you are that would be my kind of intuitive response mm. yeah i haven't thought about that much mm -hmm. yeah i also uh, realized that because it would be easier to continue talking about this if i had concrete examples but I, they don't spring to mind instantaneously mm -hmm. i just recall having read about that perspective and I, over the course of this conversation i remembered because I, i i had a vague memory of like there being this trade of relationship between resilience and something but then it just bumped to mind and i just like tried putting it out there in case you had something to say about it but yeah let's not uh, dwell in that for longer um But I'm thinking maybe we'll go to the topic of survival mm -hmm. at this point, unless there's something you want to wrap up uh, regarding mm -hmm. the the previous. No, survival is good. Plus, yeah. Okay. So there are six survival pri priorities that you've talked about, and. Uh, Or, or you tend to frame it as six because there are other possible categorizations also. Yeah, but, uh, like I've seen other models, but I, to my best judgment, six is pretty complete. Hmm. You've also used the distinction uh, between sort of two types of survival situations where the type one as i understand it is just like acute survival situation where it's obvious that you're in a critical situation where you need to take quick action uh, or or else and the type two is maybe all, not always as obvious as yeah one. but it might still require as quick action mm -hmm. um, yeah talk about that Yeah, so f first of all, the word survival, it's uh, French survive. It means to continue living or to overlive, to live through something, to continue living. Aha, survive contains the vive, which yes. is... Yes, uh -huh. sur, survive, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and, and I think the opposite is suicide. I don't know. Um, Or, or death. I mean, like sometimes you don't survive, even though you might want to continue living. So, um, most often, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Most often, I guess. Yes. Um, so the type one is, as you said, this acute one, like you find yourself in a sinking car that has reared off the road um, and it's sinking. And you know that your actions or your, your survival in the next minutes up to, well, maybe not in this situation, but in general, like, you know, foreseeable future, like, you know, next minutes, hours, days is dependent on your action right now, right? Where, where you can usually also clearly see what is the problem, like which of the six survival priorities uh, is in jeopardy. Like you fall without a parachute from an aeroplane, it's not food what is on your mind, right? It's shelter. Um, and and if you go in the sinking car, you're also not sinking, thinking that like, oh my God, I need water, right? The, the situation defines what priority it is. So type one situation, usually more obvious. Type two, usually not so visible, right? It might be... Um, You know, it's like a, like a fire. If you have like you know, it needs oxygen, uh, fuel, and heat. If you take one completely away, the fire goes out. But also, if you take from all three of them enough away, the fire will also go out. Yeah, even though there might still be some heat remaining, some oxygen remaining, and some fuel remaining. So, um, and with the type two situation, 
you usually have like most commonly the type 2 situation is not noticed while you can still act but it's usually noticed too late like an example is like very kind of typical is uh have you heard of trench foot no okay have you heard of um um well it, it's anyhow like it's people who were fighting in trenches or are fighting in trenches in wars um you know it's it's a place that is cold and moist right you have like cold air goes mm -hmm. down moisture accumulates in the trenches so even though you you might still have a dry sleeping place um and you might every now and then be warm and well fed and you might have medical care and you might have uh water to drink it's all together over an extended period of time not enough to actually keep your body alive right you're kind of dying so slowly that you don't notice it but right? you don't get enough sleep but you get some sleep you don't get enough food but you get some food so you you might and every now and then your stomach might even be full right you cannot eat more but in the long term your your body will go weaker more tired you make more mistakes you're more easily like um, falling ill and and then at some point your body cannot compensate anymore and then it goes rapidly down and once it goes once once you're over this limit that your body can still compensate once it's going rapidly down then it's actually too late to do something the time to do something is before the problem there is you usually don't notice it right and so same as mentioned before like you know you you don't notice the energy input output of our of of, of our food yeah um at the same time the priority is not covered but still there's food right but still you don't feel it you're like we don't feel it as a society even um and this is all fulfilling all criteria for for a survival situation type 2 in this case um like our air is not good enough to stay healthy right we have a lot of people who die because of air pollution um we have a lot of people who die from bad drinking water or pollutions in in you know any way coming through through food or water in our bodies like microplastics are having effect on our health and so on so the water we drink is like we are not thirsty but the water is not good enough um and so that is type two and that is type one yeah so what's next next could would be uh, what to do if you identify to be in one or what how do we continue so it's equally important to know if you're in a survival si situation as it is important to know that you're not in one um because if you're not in one you you have leeway to do to kind of to work on your resilience if you are in one you might not be able to work on your resilience but you have to fix things first before you can resilience is something for the future dealing with survival situation is right now um and the very good way to deal with survival situation is to stop doing what you're doing for a moment to actually understand the situation understand the mechanisms um, take a look at the opportunities at hand to actually really figure out what is the situation and what possibilities you have um, there is a tool called the stop tool um, that is designed to to, or it helps to avoid panic because panic is something that quite easily sets in if you have the feeling that you are in a survival situation and panic can make us act in irrational ways like it can make us uh, release release adrenaline when we don't really need it yeah, like for example if you're in this sinking car if you're a trained firefighter and you have been rescuing people out of sinking cars and you have trained how to get out of sinking cars you will not panic because this is a you know a, a situation that you understand and it's 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 something that you know how to get out of if you have never been in a sinking car before you are more likely to panic 
and you are more likely to not act as calm as the trained firefighter would in this situation. So, um, which actually means that it's really good to train skills, right? Variety of big skills that that once you are in a situation that others might describe as a survival situation, that it will not be one for you because you have, you know, acquired some skills or or ways of thinking that helps you deal with the situation. Um, the the stop tool is is a tool that it's an abbreviation S T O P stop think observe plan. Uh, that's a very short version of it. So if you think of a type one situation, it's like stop, take a deep breath, right? This stopping is like there to to stop you from doing something that makes it worse, or it stops you from doing something that doesn't help. Like in, in our situation, we can now continue as we are doing, not helpful, or we can do something that is not helpful either. Like where we have no idea if it will help or not, and we are wasting a lot of time and energy on something that does not help. Um, and the stop is also there for you to to create this little bubble where you can actually think. Yeah, it gives you takes you like kind of out of the situation. And I've modified this tool a little bit and added thank to the think and also tea, to have a cup of tea, right? Do something that, you know, creates a bit of a comfort zone. And the thinking, the gratitude, I think is really important right in the beginning of using the stop tool um, because it opens your mind to positive thinking. Even if it's like, <sighs> I'm still alive, right? I can still act. Like, you know, even the accident might be bad, just have a, short moment of gratitude that you're still alive and that you can still act and then the thinking is about first of all understanding the situation what priorities are affected what is the what is the most urgent issue yeah maybe i'm bleeding to death before the car is actually sinking so i first need to fix the bleeding then figure out how to get out of the car um so understanding the situation um, and thinking, what what is the what is the situation? What are the priorities? Am I actually in a survival situation, or maybe not? Um, from the T, it goes on to the O, which is observe, orientate, um, look at the options that are available, opportunities that there are. Um, right, there there might be a, a hammer in the car that can help you smash the window. There might be a a, a knife that can help you cut your seatbelt. There might be you know, um, the the blinking button or maybe the horn is still working, right? Just it can attract attention of others who maybe see the car, right? Call community in. Um, you might still have like, you know, a moment to check your phone, how to get out of a sinking car, right? You will find a quick video how to use your seat belt lock to break the window. Um, so that's the O phase of the stop. Just a tiny pause, like I'm realizing that I have no idea of the time frames that are uh, available in a sinking car. Oh, it can be like, really slow, it can be fast. It, how, it, how slow? Um, how slow, it, it can be minutes, right? Like if you have like, um, you know, um, good seals on the doors, no water is coming in, if the car is not too heavy, right, it will float for quite some time. Yeah, if it's a big car with a big trunk, uh, like in UN, so there was a um, like kind of a van that had driven off into the river, like they forgot the parking brake and just rolled into the river, and it was floating like a couple of hundred meters down the river, like without sinking at all, right? They could just fish it out; it just didn't sink. Yeah, so it really depends. Um, you know, if you have a convertible, like roof open car or windows open car, it will sink really fast. Yeah, so okay, yeah, go on. That was just interesting. Yeah, yeah. I realized I haven't thought about yeah. it ever. Yeah. Um, so if you have a damaged car, you know, with leaks in it, where water can get in faster or actually air out faster, yeah, then, then, um, then you will sink faster. Yeah. Um, yeah. So P is then the 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 plan, 
like to make a plan based on what you have thought and what you have observed. And, and this is usually a lot better educated plan than as if you just do something without this stopping. And this stop, you know, going through this whole stop procedure, you know, it can be done in a matter of half a minute, right? It can be really, really quick. Um, and when I now look at the using the stop tool and applying it like for for kind of our overall survival situation, the, our type two that we find ourselves in, then I strongly recommend uh, the tool that I developed called the full moon full stop. If you want to go there, I happily sure. do. Yeah, I was going to ask about that next. Yeah, so um, like this is in 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 the nomad town. Like I've, you know, it's not just developing tools, right? Like you know how to build a, a windmill out of recycled materials, but also like because this is not maybe as scalable as using a tool that helps you to figure out how to build a windmill. Right, you can, you know, I could share how to build a windmill, but somebody might not have access to the materials that I used for the windmill, or might not have the location for using a windmill, or uh, might not have, you know, the tools to build it, or whatever. Um, with the stop tool, however, which is a social technology, the full moon full stop, it guides you to finding out what works for you in your place. So that is. Like when I said that in Nomaton we look for scalable solutions, like something that works elsewhere also. It's actually mostly the social stuff that is more scalable than the technical stuff um, because the social stuff is not dependent on, on circumstances as much as the technical stuff would be. Um, so the full moon full stop came into being after... I have been teaching the stop tool in my survival courses. Then my son was born, and then I realized I panic because I cannot fulfill my parent role of teaching survival to my offspring, which is kind of the role of parents, right? Um, and I was like quite depressed through this, and then figured out, okay, the stop tool that I'm using or teaching in my survival courses for kind of wilderness survival situations, maybe I should apply it to my own life. And then I did it once, and then I thought, okay, um, that helped me, but I needed to, like the plan that I formed, you know, it, it had to be a bit more specific. You know, I can't just make a plan without an open end. So I needed a deadline for it. And then it said, okay, in one month I look again. And then I realized, okay, I need something that reminds me you know, now it's again one month, now it's again one month. And I thought, okay, the full moon is marked in the calendar. I just pick the full moon, and every time on full moon, I stop. Every day on full moon, I stop for a day. In the beginning, it was like I would go to the forest and would actually go to the forest a day before full moon and come back a day after full moon and was on my own. Um, and then just use the stop tool. And, and so from that, it kind of came into being called the full moon full stop, that at every full moon, I make a full stop and just think about like my life situation, um, also my community situation. Also nowadays I also think about my global situation and, um, and then observe, like think the situation just as described earlier in the describing the stop tool. I edit, um, in the in the abbreviation stop, I added uh, S like go on strike because sometimes full moon is on a Tuesday, right? Or it's not always weekend, so you cannot always just say like, oh, it's convenient, I have it on a free day. So I just chose to do it whenever it was full moon and that uh, I was working in, in some uh, childcare program for some time and uh, the workers knew that okay when it's full moon Huck has a day off <laughs> like he's not coming on full moon um, and then I really used the day to to stop and and like it might sound like you know having a day off you know like doing nothing as the word stop implies but actually like you know it might require a lot of thinking it might require a lot of tea 
right? And and especially the O, the observing, um, it might require some internet research, like you know, looking at okay, my problem is that uh, I still have a car, right? I still need a car. I don't want to need a car. Okay, what options I have? Is there some, you know, neighborhood car sharing blocks car kind of thing available here? Is there some opportunity to? you know, uh, in, like copy paste a ride sharing app into my area, like, or, or with food, like, so I just go one survival priority, look at all of them. And then usually I only pick two to take care of in the next month. So I focus on two and community is always one of them. Because community is like, more important than anything from those six. So yeah, so I edit um the strike edit the thank and the t uh and then with the p i also edit positive choose positive and party like celebrate the achievements of the last month um and the the positive as as an addition to the letter p like it's actually one of probably the most important parts of using this tool um, especially when we're so, I don't know, drowned in, in negative news or like how bad things are. Um, cause when, when you research like, um, documentation of survival situations, and I'm talking kind of type one now, like, because people document when they are in survival situations, right? They might suddenly start writing diary or record themselves, make audio messages or write messages out that later are discovered or found, um, or that they later maybe present to others and write a book about it or make a movie from it or something. So, and we find that from those recordings, the, there is a difference between people who have been in very similar situations some of them made it, some of them didn't make it. And one of the main differences is that those that made it, they believe that they can make it. And those that didn't make it, of course, there are like, you know, some that really had no chance, but a really decisive factor was that people tried despite not knowing if it will work out. And this choice of positive is something that I find so extremely important, not just you know, because it makes sense to me, uh, but also it gives me a much better feeling to go about life than as if I'm like, oh, I have no idea like if this is enough what I'm doing, but I try anyway, but I really don't know, is it really enough? I don't know. So, uh, and, and it also matches with uh, like, you know, Buddhism teaches t teachings that like there is no way to happiness, that happiness is the way, right? So that this, like I'm, I'm often like asked when, when I meet people that like, why are you so positive about this? Right? Isn't our situation so bad? How can you be so positive? And and I feel like, why shouldn't I be optimistic? Because there is so much that I can do. I see so much, you know, low hanging fruits. Uh, you know, I see so much easy to 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 implement stuff that really gives me hope because most of the stuff that I see is just based on mindset shift and communication and individual decisions and, and not complex legislation making. So yeah, really positive about that. And P is part of the stop since then. Uh, positive is part of the P since then. Mm. And it got me out of my depression. Hmm. Maybe you can also talk a bit about the meaning of choosing the full moon yeah so i mean the like one thing to to choose the full moon was really to have this once two months reminder and also like i wanted to have something to to make this tool more scalable i wanted it to be something that is not you know tied to to religious beliefs or national borders or anything so a full moon is a global phenomena it's like around the world is on the same day. Um, and it's like, we, we also used to have this kind of sacred days like Sunday or Friday or Saturday, depending on the religion. There was like the Sabbath, the, the 
spiritual holy day, um, which was some a day for reflection. So I think that we are lacking, right? The 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 importance of religions has you know gone down. So we are lacking also part of this community. I mean, we could talk long about this part, like you know the the lack of community through um, you know kind of a like like let's say at least with religions people used to meet who believe what the others believed also and now we are not much meeting people who believe what we believe um which is you know not necessarily supporting own beliefs right you might feel like you're very alone with your belief if you don't meet anyone else who is believing the same um so the the full moon full stop or the full moon is neutral of of the religious beliefs it's like a natural phenomena um and it's it's independent of borders and it's a monthly reminder it also gets me back into rhythm like a, a natural rhythm that is followed by pretty much everyone else in the natural world like the the full moon is affecting you know the natural world like hardly anything else right it's it's starting from low tide and high tide it's going influencing winds and currents and and everything that is connected to to for example the transport of nutrients from low tide and high tide like you know a lot of small organisms are impacted by the moon it's like you know a big big player and i think it's quite nice to to somehow remind ourselves that we are part of the same rhythm um women have a le slightly easier reminder uh, men are lacking that no. what else about the full moon some people say like isn't it better to have it new moon full stop because kind of the new moon is the place for new stuff and and full moon is some tabula rasa <laughs> yeah um but I always feel that you know there are full moon parties around the world, not so much new moon parties, and and I think we can see the full moon coming, right? You can see it. You just need to look up if you're lucky enough to have a sky that is not so polluted with light that you can see the full moon or clouds or fog or whatever. So we can see it coming. We don't need a calendar for it. And like nowadays, I'm I'm not particularly. By the way, next Friday now we are end of September. Next Friday is full moon um so i'm usually trying to pick a date somewhere around right where it's convenient if i for example now on friday i'm like in the middle between two conferences it would not be possible for me to stop there or it would not be so beneficial for me to stop right then and yeah it's grown like i have at some point this uh stop has you know become easier like i don't need to think every month again I, i'm still describing you know I, like i'm kind of more easily more easier understanding my situation in the very beginning of using this tool i needed three days to go one through the stop now it can take me a couple of hours and if i take a group on board like then um and do it with many people then it can take a whole day easily um uh, with breaks and and maybe walks in between or little meditations um and, and a lot of communication and researching so it can easily take a whole day and um yeah i now know people in sweden denmark norway finland netherlands austria and germany who used the full moon full stop australia also so and i'm quite happy about that because people report that it's like been very useful it's kind of a, you know anchoring somehow the life and giving perspective and you know also not only perspective in terms of you know like getting a bigger picture but also giving a you know perspective towards the future like that you know like you you might not you know be able or, or unlikely one is able to fix all six survival priorities from one month to another 
Um, but at least within one year, with the help of the full moon full stop, you can easily move your personal overshoot day four months into the future, which is quite something. So it really gives perspective and, and it gives long term goals. Like, yeah. Hmm. You've covered this a bit too, but still, I'd like to explicitly ask the question of what do you think are the most important survival skills? Curiosity. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe a bit of adventurous mischief. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know if it's a skill, but to, you know, some, some kind of being, being open to taking risks or actually being you know for, like I'm, i'm really careful with using the word risk because i think it's a lot more risky not to try everything than trying something right like you know when i when i you know people like didn't you think it's risky to move into a yurt like you had no idea what was going on you know how it will be so wasn't it risky and uh, and i feel like no it was a lot more risky to stay living in this house you know as as that house was set up at that time so No, I found it a lot more risky to to continue what I had than than the trying something new. Um, so a bit of like risk friendliness, um, not yeah, important survival skills. Mm. Somehow learning to improvise. To Yeah, to try things to also being open to connect with others. Like I think it's very important, like communication in general. Um honesty. I don't know. Like it's it's a huge overlap between, you know, how to be a good human values and and uh And and practical practical stuff like I I think that you know, a lot of survival courses one of the first things you learn is or at least one day people spend on making fire with a bow drill where I feel like okay this is not so relevant like when will the situation arise that you need to actually make fire with a bow drill like you know really handmade friction fire. Is like really unbelievable experience to do that. You know, the first time you have a fire burning in front of you that you made with your own hands and just from rubbing a few sticks together in the right way is is really good feeling. It's not really a relevant survival skill. Maybe if you you know come into a very unlikely situation of you know falling without equipment into the middle of a forest somewhere, you know then then it might come in handy. But it's it's like Is preparedness or or avoid hmm, preparedness is somehow important? Like kind of having an agile mind, like being opportunistic, being trying out new things. Um, I don't know what is the most important survival skill. Like I mean, it's being in love with life is probably the most important survival skill. Yeah. Hmm, interesting framing of love as a skill, but in a way it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like I mean, I mean that like the, the best. You know, to this question, the best thing comes to your mind. To my mind, like kind of the most important thing. If you're in love with life, then you will pick up the skills necessary to take care of that life. Um, more more easily than as if you, you know, just accumulate skills without knowing why, right? Yeah. Like you need a driver behind mm. it. So, what comes to mind when you hear the word survivalism? <laughs> uh, what comes to mind? 
a lot of prejudices or I, 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 I'm think about people who are preppers, um, people who are called preppers who wouldn't call themselves preppers. Um, I think about people who totally misunderstand things. Um, and I also think about common sense, right? Survivalism is common sense. If you're, you know, born to be alive, you know, if, if survival is not on your list of priorities, then you have an issue, right? So it's like quite common sense to, you know, have this, but survivalism, hmm. Yeah, often it's like um, the scene of preppers, you know, people who hoard food supplies and ammunition and, and build have bunkers. build bunkers and have like gallons of fuel to run their generators, um, build fences around their properties, have bug out vehicles and bug out backpacks and bug out places and prepare for when the shit hits the fan scenarios. Yeah, not much survival in there, um, I think. Like, because like, you know, even if, if your approach to survival would be to, let's say you want to build some kind of Moomin Valley, right? Some, some idyllic eco-village somewhere off grid, totally disconnected from the rest of the world, totally self-sustained, right? You would be quite good quite able to survive long time if you have the right people there. At the same time, your survival would still be impacted and affected by what's happening in the rest of the world, right? If there is some war, if there's some pollution, if there's, you know, forest fires, if there is like viruses, it would still impact you, right? So, so going into this kind of extreme off-grid situation without interacting with the outside world will, you know, not sufficiently help you to actually survive, right? So without the interaction with the rest of the world, there's not much value there. So um, same same with the preppers, like, you know, if you prepare for a shit hits the fan scenario, while, you know, I don't know how much more shit we want to see hitting the fan. Uh, and, and then you actually throw more shit at the fan by you know, buying all kinds of gimmicks and 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 gas guzzling vehicles and uh, buying all kinds of new stuff, then you actually add stress to the systems. Um, and you know, like there are preppers who have permaculture books for just in case. You know, I might need a permaculture one day. Just build the fucking permaculture and live from it, and you will reduce impact and make uh, you know take shit out of the fan actually. Um, yeah, survivalism. Mm. What about the word primitivism? <laughs> Valuable, right? Like primitive skills, like um, primitive living, so-called primitive, is by far not primitive. It's very sophisticated. If you put sophisticated and primitive on the same or, or opposite each other. so Do you know the etymology for the word primitive? Mm, no. Pri prim prima. So. Prima is something first yeah. and something like the first, like origin, like um, I guess like how people used to live before oil and mm. plastic and metal. Um, I think it's extremely important because it's very rooting. You know, as I, for example, described, like, you know, making fire with a bow drill is like really teaches a lot of who we are like how 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 much is enough also like um you know if if you have ever made fire with a bow drill or with a flint and steel you will feel weird using a lighter every time you use a lighter because you know it's like a bit too much right um so it's it's in a way quite quite important i'm also embracing that there are people practice and live primitive skills um Is it scalable? Not for this amount of people. 
Will the last humans who will still be alive live primitive lifestyles? Not unlikely. Right, Th those are then probably the people who have been living primitive lifestyles all along anyway, right? Like some uncontacted, isolated, indigenous community somewhere. Mm. What else to think about primitivism? Yeah, it should be probably more celebrated than than shamed or named or laughed upon. Like and you know, people laugh upon like, oh you primitive hippies, you know, like celebrated valuable skills being conserved, valuable um you know, very humble lifestyle approaches. Very, very humble, you know, cannot probably cannot be more humble than that. Um You cannot live a primitive lifestyle without being deeply nature connected. Like it's kind of contradicting each other. So it's probably the best lifestyle we can live according to human nature. At the same time, not the most realistic lifestyle for most of us. Like best in terms of, you know, up to the standard of human human capabilities, I think that is, yeah. It's, it's very impressive to, to, to meet people who, who, who can live from the planet without metal and plastics. It's very impressive. It's like, it's also humbling, you know, like when you see that, it's like, wow. It's something you automatically want, you know, it feels natural. Yeah. Mm. And it's, it's something that makes me somehow sad that it's not an option for me. Like, you know, it's like as much as I would live even in the Moomin Lakso, like Moomin Valley, I feel like okay, I have I have a responsibility and possibility to to fix stuff here. So, and and with the same, like I'm I'm extremely happy that some people practice primitive living and continue doing living in primitive ways uh, as a hobby or as a as a life, right? Um, at the same time, it's not sufficiently scalable for the masses to to ease our pressure on the planet on time mm. does the word progress make sense to you and if so in what sense and which context mm. progress as in development or yeah and in the context of societies and maybe also if i deal in it a bit not in the context of rediscovering previous ways of doing things that work but but when it relate in relation to a kind of this moving forward or yeah yeah and discovering novel ways of doing things mm. and uh, and you know inventing technology or inventing whatever you can invent yeah i mean like we cannot go backwards right so it's like we can only progress that's that's what i believe um we can and we should or are, i think well advised to look backwards and and um, maybe choose to progress in different direction, or maybe even like 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 when I when I when I look at, for example, what this uh, activist group, uh, the last generation, you know, like doing a lot of street blockades where they glue themselves to the street, and and among others, they say, well, we have tried everything else. Like this is the last possibility before violence, right? So. So we have tried everything else and everything like 
maybe we should look a bit back because maybe something that we have tried before would work now, right? But it didn't work back then. So, so I think progress is something that is inevitable. Like we cannot help but progress forward because that's how time somehow works in my limited understanding of time and space. Um, and at the same time, that doesn't mean to let go of, of old stuff. Like I think we can progress with old stuff, right? We can progress with bicycles. We don't need rockets to progress. Um, and I think that a lot of the progress, the question is how do we measure it? Do we look at quantity or quality? Because we can, you know, have a lot of progress in quality without progressing in quantity, right? Like you, you might say that, well, we have progress because we live longer or we have like, you know, bigger salaries or, you know, whatever people might call progress. Um, It really depends on how, what do we measure, and again, why also. If you think about what you know or understand or consider plausible regarding human history, do you perceive something that you could call moral progress? So not just on the level of individuals, but over the course of human history? Oh, a lot. Like, and 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 then again, like you know, it might be something like, for for example, like I think it's 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 progress that we. Um, like uh, I thought of moving the microphone, remember it good. <laughs> um, so I think we have a lot of progress in terms of like, uh, especially in the German language with male and female articles, like a lot has changed just in the language, even how it's written to to be more inclusive on more equal and and I don't know um so I think that's that's a progress right um at the same time I know that in some cultures already thousands of years ago they already like recognized seven different genders right so it's not necessarily something new for us humans but it might be something you know new in recent developments so what else? Um, if you think about, let's imagine a somewhat stereotypical example of a, what you would call a primitive, very nature-connected society. Can there be a moral progress in such a society? Mm, why not? Can you give an example of what that would look, look like? might might look like mm, we need to think mm. like i don't know where, where, where is the moral progress or like let me think Oh, I'm blank on this one. <laughs> okay, let's talk a bit about roots. Do you feel that you have roots? Roots, yes. Uh, that are connected to particular traditions or places or whatever. Mm. Like I feel that 
I have some kind of deeper roots here in Finland and some still in Germany or in the places that our species calls Finland and Germany. Um, generally, I feel quite rooted in this planet. Um, at the same time, I feel also like my mother always said, like, um, we, we want to give our children wings and rules, which is probably like a quote from someone, um, Goethe maybe. Um, and I think they succeeded quite well. Like my brother and me were both quite open to the world and, and happy to explore and roam and, and at the same time, like I feel like rooted in, in values, I feel rooted in places, of course, um, some more than others. Uh, some places are just more familiar, but I feel like, yeah, quite. I'm quite rooted in a certain kind of forest, like kind of my childhood forest. It's like kind of beech and oak trees, um, lots of leaves on the ground. Um, feeling very rooted there. Like very calm, very home. Would you say that you feel more rooted in types of places than particular places? <clears throat> no, not necessarily. I mean, maybe sauna is one of those examples actually where, where I feel like rooted in the type of place and not in the particular sauna. Like there are saunas where I feel like really like ugh, so rooting, also rooted, so home. Like, and then there are like, you know, in, in general, when I go to a sauna, I feel like ugh, sauna, which, um, Reminds me, I need to check the time because we have a sauna time tonight. <gasps> what does fatherhood mean for you? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Somehow like a biased responsibility. You know, like I, I feel that like... As a father, I feel like particularly responsible for my child. At the same time, I feel like I should not feel more responsible to, for my child than for the rest of life, right? Like fatherhood means for me to actually, oh man, you're opening a big one. Um, Like it, it is, it is doing painful compromises. Like for example, I would have really loved to continue this family life in this house. Would have been really nice. Uh, at the same time, I felt like I cannot choose not to try a sustainable or more sustainable or as sustainable as possible lifestyle because I have a responsibility to show this to my child. And so I kind of sacrificed the family bond for the sake of serving life um, and actually serving life even more directly, like more directly serving life than serving my own child, right? Kind of, it's more like serving my own child through, through the detour, right, of serving life. Because of course, my son's survival is dependent on the well-being of life in all its diversity. So to take care of my child, I need to take care of life. So, and that it almost feels like a compromise because it was so nice to have this, you know, cozy family bubble where I feel like, you know, as a child, I would like to grow up in that. I would not like to be confronted with like, you know, what some, some so-called adult things is, 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 uh, valuable for me. Um, and I say so-called adult because there's a lot to talk about adulthood and 
uh, maturity and and also initiation into adulthood um big topic also by now i start feeling like i'm an adult i love it that you mentioned initiation because the question that i will not ask about is that i just heard that you are in the kohtus varassa seminar that's this week yeah you're going to be talk talking about rites of passage mm -hmm. and uh yeah maybe we get some opportunity maybe we can do a, a virtual follow-up where you talk a bit about your thoughts mm -hmm. regarding regarding rites of passage but yeah i will leave that question unasked for now i can just say like extremely beneficial for us to to give them to us each other and to ourselves rites of passage ideally initiated no. it's a really interesting topic and i've heard from people who have tried to tried to a sort of create rites of passage to western cultures where they don't as such exist that one challenge has been related to whereas in traditional cultures where someone goes through a rite of passage the whole community welcomes them back mm. as a changed person. yeah that's the usually the i mean we have some kind of replacement stuff like i don't know for some it's army for some mm. it's it's the confirmation camp um for some it's the number 18 for some it's like and and the kind of the most important part of the ritual the reincorporation into the new society right because you're initiated and then become part of a new group a new face in your life people who are in the same phase as you like you're in the group of adults like the group of adults need to welcome you and treat you different give you different rights different responsibilities otherwise you will not be you know it will not be in in kind of enforced or in empowered or or supported this new being and you might quickly forget who you are yeah and and the the lack of this kind of adulthood initiation is something very visible in you know trump and you know other 65 year old and older teenagers no okay five short final questions that i present to all of my guests you can answer with one sentence or more if necessary the first one is an early memory that has affected the course of your life Mm, my neighbor the memory of my neighbor who was a bit like my replacement grandfather because most both my grandfathers died before i was born um and so there was this neighbor my father's cousin's husband who who was kind of my replacement grandfather and i have like he just comes to my mind affects my life yeah A thing that inspires you. Or it doesn't have to be a thing, it can be a process or whatever. Um, like collateral beauty. You know, like when you when you you know see in the middle of asphalt you see this dandelion popping out. You know, where like that really inspires me like where where you have like this beauty that is not intended but it just you know like the dandelion itself would not be as beautiful among all other dandelions at least in the perception as if it is standing now in the middle of this asphalt jungle so this is collateral beauty inspires me other people inspire me other animals inspire me mm. You actually answered the next one before, but if you want to either elaborate or pick up pick out another example 
something that you're afraid of or that brings fear in you? Fear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unreasonable fear. Especially that one. If things go in an optimal direction, you've also covered quite a bit of this. Where will you be going, let's say five years from now? Five years from now. What um, kind of a direction? Yeah, so in five years from now, I'm hopefully able to live out of my backpack again. Um, I intend to kind of die naked. And I don't know how much time I have left, maybe another 10 years. I'll be quite happy with another 10 years. So it means that I'm starting to, yeah, in five years, I should have built down sufficiently to not be too far away from that. Mm. Five years from now, the Mekriyari project can stand on its own legs. I would be not necessary there anymore, could move on. Mm to New Horizons, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know tomorrow. Mm. And finally, you can send your wish or your encouragement or your prayer or whatever to humans. Mm. Keep up the good work their adventures and connect on the common ground under our feet and wheels and wings and keels, the common ground, yeah, that's a shared why. Thank you, Huck. Thank you, Henry. Okay, thank you for listening to my conversation with Hak Mideke. I hope you uh, were inspired by that and that uh, Hak's ways of being in the world and looking at the world gifted something to you. I hope you will be thinking about these themes as you go on with your life and uh, bring something valuable back with you. And uh, yeah, just as a closing reminder, your likes, comments, subscriptions, shares are very much appreciated, as are also your Patreon subscribes. So if you want to join my Patreon page, support my work, please do that. And as I mentioned in the be- beginning, I will be posting an extra bit of conversation with me and Huck on my Patreon pages, both the English and Finnish ones. Okay, yeah, may the wild be with you.